Hey everybody, before we start the MinMax Show podcast, wanted to let you know that Another Eden, The Cat Beyond Time and Space is available now on Steam. Another Eden is from the legendary game creator Masato Kato, who's the writer of Chrono Trigger and he has credits including Xenogears and more. So Another Eden is a classic single player JRPG that's completely free to play. There's not pay to win, there's no stamina systems or any of that icky stuff. It's a surprisingly pure JRPG experience there. So Another Eden is out now on Steam. You can use the link below, which is bit.ly slash minmax, all lowercase, to tell them that MinMax sent you to check it out. Hello and welcome to the MinMax Show, a place about games, friends, getting better. I'm Ben Hansen, joined by Jeff Marchiafava. He said hello, you couldn't quite hear him. And then we have Kyle Hilliard. Hello, did that come through? Uh, yeah, but you sound like crap. But you know who's going to sound great is a new voice. Not just a new voice, but a new official cohort here at MinMax, out of the blue, Janet Garcia. What is good? What is good, Janet? Thank you for being here. Round of applause, everybody. If you're watching or listening at home, please hey, give that round of applause. You. Um, Janet, you might um, you might remember her voice from a couple episodes. Let's see, you were on talking about the most exciting upcoming games for 2021, and then you're on talking about the Final Fantasy VII Battle Royale, who can forget it, uh, and then you called it a better quest as well, but uh, thank you for uh, making this official, Janet. Yeah, thanks for the invite. Honestly, like, when you first reached out to me, you were like, oh, like, here's what I'm thinking, you know, take some time to think it over. I'm like, I've thought this over before you even contacted me. So this worked out. Um, but yeah, like full transparency. I mean, I'd, I'd been interested in taking on a role like this for some time. So uh, making it official and actually having it happen and having it also fit into what I'm already doing uh, is is awesome. I'm so excited. I do feel a little bit like the new kid at school, mm. but I'm excited to be here. Yeah, but it's all a digital school, so we can't bully you, really. It's pretty easy, I'd have to imagine, yeah. I'm yeah, excited. Well, I went to public school, so I'm pretty rough to, to bully in, okay. in terms of having actual, like, moving the needle. So I think I'll be all right. All right, well, perfect. Yeah, I'm excited for just uh, your former IGN. A lot of us here are former Game Informer, and so I'm excited just to, like, have those flavors mix. <laughs> like, you know, like yeah. IGN and GI seem like on the opposite ends of, I'd argue, the country. Um, so it's just, a, it's a cool <laughs> idea of like, okay, let's just create this little hive mind of MinMax and pool all of our best ideas together and, and hopefully create something wonderful. So thanks for being here. Yeah. Um, on this episode of the podcast, um, we are going to talk about 2021 in general, the winners, the losers so far, uh, some game delays, some very promising indie games, uh, then some games we've been playing, uh, other things here and there. Kyle insists on talking about Balan Wonderworld. He said um, yes. nobody in the world can stop him from ranting and raving about that game. Uh, then we're going to talk about Monster Hunter Rise, and then back half of the show, Serial's coming in, and we're answering some wonderful community questions, including a lot of people who have a lot of questions for you, Janet. So I just want to give you a heads up now. Just brace for impact. A lot of people are going to have a lot of thoughts, and you're going to be just raspy by the end of it. Great. Well, I have a stream after this, so that'll that'll lead right into it. Oh, great. <laughs> it's going to be wonderful. Um, hey, Jeff, um, have you noticed that 2021 is kind of a weird year? No, I hadn't. Oh, yeah, it is. It's I really stayed still bizarre. in quarantine. <laughs> Staring at I've the left my house like five times this year, I think. Have you been like super, super strict just because of the, the baby? Yeah, we, we've still been... Pretty strict. We had like one outdoor meeting with uh, my wife's sister and and friend, um, and I, we went on a walk with my mom. My mom came down to the neighborhood, and wow. we went on a walk. But we all still have masks and everything. So. How's the vaccine hunt going? Uh, my wife and I just got notified we're scheduled for next Thursday. We get our first. Wow. Shot, so. We're looking forward to that. Congratulations. Congrats. Yeah, I haven't gotten that email yet, but uh, I have this uh, list of some site that shows whatever the, wherever there's openings in, in Minnesota and North Dakota and stuff. Um, the the vaccine pre-order. Basic, <laughs> it honestly feels like trying to get a new console. It's such a weird vibe. I'm just yeah. constantly hitting refresh and then trying to do the math about yeah. like, is it worth People driving? People say they're going to email you, but no one's emailing you. <laughs> yes, you know, that's exactly. the situation. It's I've like, got... I thought you would let me know. No, <laughs> no. I've got Wario 64 notifications turned on. So like, I'm ready to get those alerts whenever they come. If we get Wario 64 on the vaccine, 
<laughs> this whole thing would be solved. Yeah, That's you really right. blew it by not tweeting that out. Um, but it's just like this weird math of, do I want to drive six hours to like northern Minnesota? Because there's like a lot of openings in rural Minnesota. But people like you, Jeff, were saying that you're getting the email anyway. So maybe I shouldn't uh, spend a couple uh, days driving. Yeah. Are you in Hennepin? Yes, I think. they Hennepin has their own website that you can um, like sign up and they will, they like directly emailed us and sent us a schedule oh, like to schedule an appointment okay so i'll give you that link that does not apply to anyone else so <laughs> great, <laughs> save it for a get a load of this opener. that'll be perfect yeah. yeah uh but more importantly how it does apply to everybody is uh the growing trend of games getting delayed obviously it's always an issue in the game industry but it seems like we are just getting rapid fire delays and like the full ramifications of COVID on the game industry are starting to come to light now obviously some delays last year but there's even stuff this year you know with ea officially canceling future development of anthem where they kind of pin that on covid or stuff like you know hogwarts legacy they're like ah that's gonna be 2022 gotham knights also 2022 uh back for blood the left for dead successor that got pushed back a bit in 2021 grand turismo 7 got pushed back lords of the ring Gollum, uh writers republic dying light 2 got pushed back still 2021 they say humankind vampire the masquerade bloodlines who knows what's going on with that sequel far cry 6 is in this weird limbo it just feels like everything in the industry is now getting hit with the impact of what it means to have hundreds, maybe thousands of developers working from home. It's crazy when you say that list like that, because like in my mind, it's like, oh, I've probably heard like two or three announcements, but it's like, no, no, there's there's a lot, you know? Right. Yeah. And so it's created this weird vacuum now where small games are rising up and like every year there's going to be, you know, one or two big indie stars but it seems like in the quarantine era they've really just been hitting hard i mean last year with among us and fall guys this year already i mean valheim and loop hero to some extent but then there's smaller games that you know i've been enjoying as well like oliha it just feels like with these big trees out of the forest now all these small trees are growing up and really becoming the champions of 2021 in an unexpected way but i guess it's a good For sure thing. and they're and they're you know mostly not affected in the same way as big ones because it's especially if you're like a one person or two person indie team you're probably working from your own home office anyway right and you and if anything you just have more time that you're spending at home you know not going out and to other places so it's you it does they don't have the the same problem of like well, we can't go to our office now. We have a hundred people that we have to Skype into meetings and things like that. Right. It feels like it's just the overall trend in society. I mean, even a small indie outlet like MinMax, it's like, yeah, COVID has been weird. We've changed our strategy. We've been able to bring in Janet, who's from California, you know, because of that. But it's just that bizarre thing of like, yeah, it has an impact on us, but it's not cataclysmic whereas for larger media organizations it's like okay how do we rewire everything it just feels like overall in society it's a time for smaller things to really blossom hopefully in a positive way but i mean valheim honestly kyle i know this is controversial at this point mark your calendars i would be shocked if something tops valheim for my game of the year at this point really oh, yeah. i'm not into it i still am loving the game every time i play it's just a wild adventure. I cannot get enough of it. What What is different about it compared to other survival games that you didn't get into? Uh, I, I like survival games. I think it just helps to have that little bit of a mainline path of like, okay, there's these bosses and you're always on the hunt for the next clue to try and find the next boss. And I think a huge part of it too is that uh, we're not looking anything up. We're just going into it and having the adventures, trying to piece stuff together, trying to figure out, like, how do we get into these crypts? What is going on here? Where do you think the next clue could be? And that has just been a game changer for just the sense of adventure that's in that game. But we don't need to talk about Valheim anymore. People kind of get the idea. Um, we should talk about some upcoming indie games, what you can play when all these other games are delayed. Um, last week, they had ID at Xbox and the Future Game Show. Uh, there's been, even PlayStation's been rolling out a lot of indie game announcements. So I thought it'd be a nice time just to share one or two or however many you're, you're super excited about to talk about for 2021. Uh, Janet, does an indie game pop out to you that you're really looking forward to this year? 
Oh, man, there's so many, honestly, like at first I only had a small handful. You know, I've mentioned uh, Kina, which I think I'm saying correctly, but Nobody I never knows. know Bridge of Spirits and yeah. smaller games like that. But um, like the idea at Xbox Showcase was just bonkers. Um, one thing I was kind of bummed about is that it was just like one massive chunk of content and not a lot smaller uh, just because it was a lot to digest. And admittedly, I only saw like a small piece of it because it went on for like hours. Like, yeah hours of content um which was you know it was cool to have like all those different games highlighted but it was it was lots of parts out luckily uh xbox did do like a a news post on their site where they kind of broke out like here's what's going on here's what's coming to game pass i think one of my favorites from there was um that game soup pot it's like a cooking game that like has a creative focus so instead of being uh as time-based or as like ability-based it's sort of just experimenting and sort of uh, it has like a lot of its achievements tied to goofy things like when the devs were on they talked about oh if you drop a piece of food on the floor and then pick it up and keep using it you get like the five second rule like you know achievement and stuff like that so um that sounded really cute it also has like um sort of a realistic art style it's not going for like hyper realism but it's not like cartoony or anything so i was drawn to that i've also just been getting just more into the sim genre in general like I think before Animal Crossing, I didn't really play a lot of sim games. Uh, I've always been drawn to stuff that's like cute or cozy, like narrative wise. Um, and I've done a lot of visual novels and stuff. But sims are sort of new to me in that sense. So I'm sort of diving in. And now that I've, you know, I've played as far as cooking games, I've played Overcooked. I finally played Cook Serve Delicious. Oh, yeah. um, earlier, I played um, this new indie game called Lemon Cake uh, that came out. That's like running, you're running a bakery. So it's been interesting seeing like the different approaches developers take towards an act as simple as cooking, like how stressful is it? You know, like you know, how is it cooperative? Like what are the different cadences of it? Um, what do people go to this? Like what makes people gravitate towards this specific one over another one? How do they compare um, since it's such a niche genre? So I'm really excited to see what their approach is to this and how it is when it finally comes out. Yeah, Supa, that's so weird. Cause when you started describing, it, I was like, okay, surely it's just gonna look like an overcooked, but it's like, no, it's like first person close up. Yeah, like you said, with these like more realistic visuals. What a weird one. Okay. Also VR yeah, that's support. That's August later 2021. On okay. Oh, perfect. Um, yeah, mine is kind of in a similar vein where um, when this stood out to me that I think was at ID at Xbox, um, but Moon Glow Bay, it was called, where it's set in Canada in the 1980s and it's a fishing RPG that has, it's all made of voxels, has a really interesting look to it. Um, but it kind of just reminds me of a larger trend where it feels like, we've probably been saying this for a while, but it feels like now 2021 is the year where all of these seeds planted with Stardew Valley are starting to blossom up. Like all these games within this window are starting to realize there is this audience out there that can be potentially huge just for friendly Sims, I guess would be like the the easiest way to to put it. But Moonglow Bay, it's from Bunny Hug. Um, It's coming to Steam and Xbox Game Pass later this year. But then like there's other Stardew Valley likes, if you want to call it that, like that uh, Witchbrook game from Chucklefish is still lingering out there somewhere. There's a game coming to Switch and PC called Bear and Breakfast. Oh, yeah, that looks really good. Where you're like a bear just building out your own little bed and breakfast and taking care of this town. A garden story, which looks a lot like Littlewood, uh, also, I believe, coming to Switch. And then Minico's Night Market, which has been years and years in the making now, but that also kind of seems like just that friendly sim social atmosphere, which is super exciting. Uh... What do you land on Stardew's fishing? Are you pro Stardew's fishing? Um, aggressively con. Uh, really? <laughs> to the point that I was so against doing more fishing in that game that I let uh, Joja win because I didn't want to finish uh, the community center. Like I just don't want to deal with it. I just don't want to deal with fishing. But that said, <laughs> maybe now it's like the next time I play Stardew Valley, uh, I can have a whole new journey and actually really get into fishing. Who knows? What, what game do you think gets fishing right? Because Moonglow Lay is is all pretty much all fishing. So yeah. like, what about this made you say, I think this one has a shot at getting it right? And then what's another game where you're like, the fishing and this is good? You know what's really stupid? I like the is fishing. Wild? <laughs> well, maybe. But I like just good, simple fishing. Like, honestly, Animal Crossing fishing, I enjoy a lot. And obviously, we know the the king. The king in the ocean for fishing RPGs is Monster of the Deep: colon, Final Fantasy 15. I mean, if you're not if you're not even trying <laughs> to compete with the king, you got to get out of the market. But I don't know. I think it's it's like that angle of focus. I guess like if the entire focus is about this fishing RPG instead of eh, it's one thing you could do in Stardew Valley, and I'd much rather just go explore the mines or have more explorations that way. But uh, Kyle, did one stand out to you? No, no, let me, oh, you're, I'm sorry. you're transitioning perfectly. Uh, my pick was Coral Island, which isn't, 
it's not officially being released this year, but it's it's going to be coming out into early access this year. And this is basically uh, another Stardew Valley Harvest Moon type game, but it's kind of it has an, a kind of tropical Asian island setting. And so and it it was a Kickstarter game that made just an absurd amount of money. Um, but it's it's it hits all it hits all those notes 1.6 million dollars it it got up to and Jeez. so that unlocked just a ridiculous amount of stretch goals and they have like apparently there's an entire merfolk city on like <laughs> civilization under the water because their scuba you know, like diving is also a, a me- mechanism for it and everything um but the the reason I ended up finding this was my wife found it because after we played that Stardew Valley board game, Hanson, yeah. she went and got the Android version of it, and she has been completely obsessed with it. She's in, like, year five now and, and is way farther. Like, she's done way more than I ever got into it. She's wait, got whoa, like, whoa, whoa, wait a second, wait a second. We reviewed on our YouTube channel, by the way, you can check it out, that Stardew Valley board game, like, a week and a half ago. Yes, and she's, she's in year five. Mind. Yeah, she's it, a new mother. <laughs> what is I, happening I mean, over yes, there? <laughs> it it may it may be year four, but basically, yeah, it's it's one of those perfect games because it's on a tablet. She can just do it whenever you know the kid's sleeping in her oh arm or, or any like any kind of downtime like that. And when she gets into games, she like she's she's always telling me that she's you know she doesn't consider herself a gamer, and it's. And it's always been such a load of crap. I always tell her, like, no, you you're more obsessive about games than I am when you really get into one. But it's always before this, she had always been into like, you know, like kind of Farmville-esque like mobile games. And I'm always right. like, just play Stardew Valley. Like it's an actual good game. And so the board game finally got her into it and she has just completely lost her mind. And so one day I came out you know, after recording and she was watching YouTube videos of upcoming Stardew Valley S games. Oh, that's and that's perfect. Where, that's where Coral Valley came into it. And Coral so, Island. And it yeah, it looks yeah, uh Cordu yes. Cordu Violine. Cordu Valley. <laughs> yes. But it uh yeah, that one that one I had I had seen that earlier too and it's it's right up my alley. And it and she also she was talking about it and she was she brought up the same thing that I feel, which is that like doing it in 3D can be real. It's we're really particular about like if a if a game is 3D and going for that farming vibe, they yeah. can screw it up really easily, oh, yeah. including like every modern Harvest Moon. It just ends up looking really cheap. Mm-hmm. But this one has a good look to it. And and it's it's bringing in a bunch of different things like durian fruit and all of these kind of more Asian things that you don't normally get in the regular farming games so yeah we're looking forward to that one that's a cool one coral island and still no release date they said uh they they have some timetable it's l- early access i think is coming out later this year and then a pc release might be at the end of the year and consoles 2022 yeah nice uh kyle something about for you yeah i mean in, in the non-sim world that's not really not opposite in any way or anything, but it is a different genre. Um, I mean, the big one for me is Solar Ash from yeah. um, Heart Machine, uh, which is like one of those things. It's like, well, you know, indie. It, uh, I believe it's self-published, but it had they they spent a lot of time with it on a recent PlayStation stream and got to really dive deep into it. So you know, they really elevated it. But it it is it is one of those things where it could have just been called you know the next Heart Machine game, and I would have been excited. Like that's all I needed because I love Hyper Light Drifter so much. But like. Everything that they've shown, just as they tease things out, it looks great. The music is looks sounds amazing. I believe it's still disaster piece. But then when they, in that recent stream where they really dove into it, it was like I think I watched a little bit of you guys streaming the show, and I think Hanson, you even said like, oh, like they're making this game for Kyle. This it's is ridiculous. a moment for Holden for Kyle. It's just like checklist everything. It's like cool art style, great movement. Uh, there's giant monsters that you can take out, Shadow of the Colossus style. It looks like you're like exploring a big open area and you can just leap from anything you want it just it looks amazing it looks fantastic and it it should be this year fingers crossed i was can you imagine being them working on this game for years and then seeing the pathless release where it's like that movement in the pathless is so close to solar ash it's wild 
I was just about yeah, to mention the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I love, I love the pathless, you know what I mean? So for me, it's like, yeah, more of that, please. But I do wonder if for them, it is a little bit of them sort of like, you know, grimacing a little bit like, oh, these, these kind of are similar, you know what I mean? Yeah. But, uh, I'm sure once you have them side by side, they're, they're going to feel very different, but, uh, yeah, I, I can't wait. And then like, just to throw out a couple other ones that I, I realized I was putting this little list together. I was like, oh, these are all like breath of the wild inspired. There's, um, Sable from oh, publisher yeah. Raw Fury that has this really cool art. So I think it was announced in like 2018. It's right. supposed to come out this year. It's like you're in a desert. You've got like a floating motorcycle. You can climb like Breath of the Wild. And then there's um, Chia, which is a T-C-H-I-A, which is a, it kind of looks almost like Moana a little bit. You're like you can explore islands with these rafts and they have in the, the trailer that they have. There's lots of shots of this little girl that you play as leaping off cliffs and throwing up a paraglider to fly around and like swimming around. It just looks like a cool, you know, exploration game. Yeah. And, um, yeah. I just want, and then I'm um, like uh, stray that cyberpunk cat game. I'm, I'm really interested in that. That looks cool. And then there was one uh, minute of islands. Uh, looks really cool. It's got this great hand drawn style. And again, you're like exploring islands. I guess that's what I'm into this year is the idea of exploring islands on the ocean. <laughs> Kyle, you should check out Valheim. Uh, if you like exploring islands on the ocean. How real is Valheim super violent? You're like hunting and stuff, right? Yeah, no, it's not violent unless I'm forgetting something. Okay. No, it's like, yeah, you kill a deer. And <laughs> there might be like an explosion of blood or it's smoke. I guess I forget. Okay. Animals explode. I think the art oh, makes it seem less violent as well. Like, yeah. you do fight things. Like, I played a little okay. bit of it because okay. everyone's going crazy over it. I'm like, let me see what's what's going on like the streets are talking and i was like this might not be for me but i'm gonna go back because you'll help me build my house and i have guilt because i need to go live in the house that they built me um <laughs> but yeah like it's in like the 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 hunting it's not very like I, I do feel like it's a lot more about exploring and existing and like you right. happen to do that as one of the gameplay things but i don't think it's like yeah. at the core of well, like what draws people to it right I'm thinking of trying to rope in my daughter to play with me and she does not want to hunt things like she's not in, she doesn't want to, but they implemented hunting in Fortnite, And I think that was, she's finally gotten over it. Where so she's Fortnite's like, going to you know train what? a new generation of hunters. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, some animals. <laughs> she just doesn't want to kill animals, which I totally understand. She's yeah. a, she's a vegetarian and has been most of her life, but like, it was. I think if there's like a gameplay incentive, I think she's open to it. That's so <laughs> you know funny. Know I mean? You know what Perfect. else you should look into, Kyle? Is the game we streamed a couple times for New Show Plus, but Raft. Uh, Raft. I don't, yeah. I don't know if okay. it's coming to out of early access this year, but it's on Steam, and I I want to go back and play that game more for sure. I really enjoy everything I've played yeah. so far. Um, Raftatui is the name of the show. Raftatui is the show. Yeah, episode three. Okay. It's it's really like Half Life Two, episode three at this point. Like it's always going to be lingering out there as a new show plus choice for people, and they'll never choose it. Just like episode three. Um, <laughs> Kyle, you've been playing Narita Boy. Yeah, yeah, I have. So this is a game that uh, was it last week or two weeks ago. Somebody wrote in and just said, "Hey, has anybody looked at this thing? This game looks absolutely wild." Narita Boy. Um, I started it. Uh, did anybody else get a chance to start it besides the two of us? I did. Yeah, too. I played like an hour of it. Oh my gosh. Okay, awesome. Awesome. Uh, Kyle, you probably played the most. What do you think about this? Uh, I like it a lot, man. It is like the big thing for me is just how just absolutely stylish it is. Like in that sort of like, I would put it in that persona tier of just like, this just looks cool all the time. You know what I mean? And I thought it was, when I first started, I don't know why I assumed it was a Metroidvania. Um, yeah. But I it's think... really not. It's pretty, it's a pretty linear game. Although I do, I, the, I do wish it had a map because I do get confused often. Yeah, it's wild but, that um, there isn't a map in that game. It feels yeah. like that's I exactly mean, the type of game they're trying to make. Oh, I got some feelings. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, deeper, the deeper you get in, which is the case with most games in general, is like you get a better understanding of where you're supposed to go. And you learn that it really is pretty linear. You're like playing these little chunks of areas that it feels like it's going to be more open than it is, but it's, it's not. But... I still find myself getting confused often and it's and it's like but I mean one thing I we talked about in our, our little meeting earlier this week is like I feel like the the story is actually I, I, or more rather the setting I guess the story isn't too deep you, you kind of unlock these memories of the person who created the world which are kind of interesting and 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 sad yeah but like in terms of just like establishing a strange world where like programming is like a religion 
I I really kind of like it. It it feels like what I always kind of wanted Tron to be, but Tron never quite was. Like Tron never got into the weird like religious angle of being a sort of created world, you know. And I like that this kind of touches on that at least. I, I so I I'm really digging it. I see myself playing it to the end. But I'd lo- I'm, I'm curious to hear what everyone thinks for sure. It definitely des- desperately wants to be Tron. Like it is such yeah. a fan of Tron. But that's that's fine. But yeah, Janet, what do you think about this thing so far? Um, I wasn't a big fan, honestly. I think, uh, so the genre, I think, is action adventure. Because I looked it up, too, because I also thought it was a Metroidvania. And I was right. like, someone told me this is a Metroidvania. I'm like, what am I playing here? It kind of uh, feels sometimes like... it's kind of fun to go in cold, too, right? Like, that's so rare to feel like it's, you don't know a lot about it. So um, I had just started it up. Um, all, out of the gate, I wish it kind of handled its story and world building a little differently. It's very front-loaded in text, which yeah. I'm totally cool with if it's a visual novel. Or it's a story game. Like, I, I love stories, and I'm like, this is what we're doing. But when it's paired with, like, a, a different gameplay of a different genre, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm, I ain't here to read. Like, I only down to read when it's a story <laughs> game. So if it's really front-loaded, I'm like, I'm not trying to read all this. I don't care. So I wish that it didn't um, front-load with so much of the world-building through text. Especially in a game like this, where, like, once you get your sword and your first weapon, you're like, oh, okay, this is actually all about the action. It's very stylized. Um, and I wish it led with that more because I think that is the more appealing part of the game and that is the core of the genre. So that yeah. was my initial gut reaction. Other than that, like as far as the combat, um, I like that it has the thing of one weapon has multiple purposes. I'm a big fan of that in games I've come yeah. to learn. Loved it in Jack control. 2. Loved it in Control. Yes. Like, <laughs> I, I I just really like that in games. So that element's cool. You have like a, a sword that can also do a beam attack. It can be a shotgun. Shotguns are pretty cool as well. Um, the combat, I would say, it looks really cool. Like, I love the um, yeah. pixelated explosions. Like, it's really beautiful, but I don't think it feels quite as smooth as it looks, which sounds kind of odd. Like, when I'm looking at myself play on screen, I'm like, I feel like I should be maybe a little bit faster in movement, like, more of a, like, zipping around. I feel a little bit sluggish. Um, so that was a little bit of a drawback for me. Again, yeah. I could just not be a very good Narita boy. That could be a me <laughs> thing. Um, and then as far as like navigation, I do think that uh, it needs a map. <laughs> and I wish that it was a little a little bit more um, forthright on, on where to go. It is fairly straightforward because like you said, it is pretty linear and they do have like arrows. I got lost really early on. I'm like, where the hell do I need to go? And then I came back to a room I was at and suddenly there was like a giant arrow there. I'm like, that arrow wasn't there before. And I was like very embarrassed <laughs> playing in my living room in front of everybody. But um, and similarly too, uh, a really small thing is... Um, when you're going through doors, you have to like, and the controls might vary based on if you're doing PC controller or whatever. Um, you need to kind of be standing at the right spot to bring the prompt to go through a door, which isn't the worst thing, but it can be confusing when there are areas where you do hit dead ends versus, so it's like, is this a dead end or is this a door? Because most of the doors are just like black shadows. They're not like physical doors. Um, yeah. So that, those are my like gut reactions. I will say once I like got out of, without spoilers, I guess, the initial area and it kind of opened up to the memories and then like the first person's memory. I was like, ooh, okay, this game has more to say than just like 80s, you know? Right. Um, and I, I like that yeah, element sure. and, and how that broke up the visuals. I love the, um, some of the the background things are really cool, like the little kind of uh, animatronic creatures that are made of like monitors. I think those are adorable and, um, you know, really charming. So I do think the world has some charm it's a little confusing to navigate uh it's not quite as slick as i wished it would be and i think the number one gripe i have is when you die in combat the screen that says uh what does it say like oh god what is rest it it's like power, re- right? rest in no. power and it says it aloud i'm like rest I'm in force get better i think game. rest in force yes yeah i'm like rest in force, i right. hate seeing this and it also kind of and maybe it's just to pad the load time as well in their defense but <laughs> whenever you have when the when the loop between failure and returning is a little bit too long it can get kind of discouraging so those are my my quick thoughts on it that was a concise video review from (laughs) jan yeah (laughs) yeah and in my one hour with narita boy (laughs) (laughs) and that that pretty much mirrors my experience with it exactly because yeah i i'm i really like the the sense of the world and the setting as kyle said but there's there are so many conversations that you hit in that in that first chunk where it's like go here talk to this person yeah. conversations longer than i want it to be 
go, I activate a monitor. Now there's another narrator talking to me kind of going through all those things. And I got, I got lost a bunch. Like, like sometimes it's just not clear what you're supposed to do. And then it's like, okay, you got an, you got another Tron disc. Well, of course you know what to do to that. Uh, I guess I'll go back up this elevator again to this other area that maybe there was another door there that I didn't. Yeah, of course this all makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the, I enjoy the actual combat when I get to it, but, but there's been surprising. It's been surprisingly sparse in terms of actual combat. And I feel like I've spent more time just kind of walking around and listening to people talk to me than I was expecting. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious. Yeah. How it evolves and how much of it is just kind of style over substance, Kyle, but do you think you're going to stick it out and play the whole thing? Yeah, I mean, I think you guys are, it is definitely like a drop you in the deep end game for sure. Like it doesn't really have a lot of tutorial. Like it's just, it just wants you to figure out the ropes on your own. And I feel like I've hit a point now where I now have a grasp on the ropes and yeah. like I'm getting into a lot more combat. I've done a lot of boss encounters. I look forward to looking back into the creator's memory. Like that's the most interesting element of the story. But like it is, it's definitely a lot there's like a swamp to wade through before you kind of get there. So like if you guys are interested, like it's one of those things, like I would encourage you to try to wade through the swamp, but like also, <laughs> you know, I, if you're not feeling it, then it's only know, six hours. Like I did, yeah. it was one of those moments yeah. where I started playing and I'm like, how long to be? And I did see one of the games I like because like, I'm obsessively game goal oriented. So I'm uh-huh. like, this is great, but when is it over? So I can play the sure. next thing, yeah. right. you know? Um, so it, it's not terribly long. Um, yeah, I do think maybe, I think it might have a weaker start than like the middle part, even just looking at like, I pulled up the trailer like off to the side mm. and I'm like, I want to get to the part where I can like, there's like a, a monitored dog that you can ride or something. I'm like, that seems cool. Or like a horse or something. I'm like, I want to <laughs> get to the weird monitor horse. Like that sounds kind of nice. <laughs> Yeah, Narita Boy. It's out on everything. Yeah, Team 17 published that. It's Studio Coba. It's a Kickstarted project from Spain, apparently. Um, cool. Kind of in that same vein of um, a game that is unbelievably stylish, uh, Genesis Noir. I, I thought... I thought you were going to say Battle in Wonderworld. <laughs> <laughs> no, man. I'm not. I'm trying Hold everything I can to house. stay away from Battle in Wonderworld for, for the time being. Uh, but, no, Genesis. Uh, I want to hear about that. Genesis Noir... Uh, also a shorter game it's like five hours um i finished it absolutely loved it but it is weird uh jeff um, did you check out genesis noir i did and you you missold me on it because yeah. you were like uh it's it's kind of like an a point and click adventure uh... game but without the puzzles and it and and so i kind of went into it like okay, I'll, I'll download this thing for Hanson and check it out. <laughs> and I was not expecting like a super jazzy, surrealist, noir kind of story, but it's, yeah, it as as soon as I started, it was like, oh, wait, what is this? This is much cooler than than Hanson sold me on. Yeah, you're right. To call it just, oh, it's a point and click is, is too confusing. It's more, I don't know. I don't want to bring it into that realm of, it's more of an experience than a game, but it is just, I mean... Yeah, like, Janet, are you in that vein? Yeah, kind of, yeah I mean, I, I definitely didn't have the warmth that you have for it. I only played it again an hour, so yeah. you can... Spoilers for, like, the prequel of this podcast. Like, I just took some hours in my morning, and I'm like, let me dig into these games. Uh, yeah, I, I will say it's it it does feel more experiential than, than like, it doesn't have, like... It, it doesn't really have puzzles. I mean, you could argue that it, I guess it does have some puzzle solving, because yeah. things like, again, only an hour in, like, the where to plant, like, the plants and things and like you know what very wh- light on you, that front when did you know what this game was <laughs> like Hansen, uh, Janet, because i, I started yeah. playing this and then i looked up what the game was and i'm like is this what i'm playing and it kind of it's there's a lot going on with it like what would be your summary of this uh, yeah i finished it a couple days ago i still don't know if i know what that game was janet it is okay we are burying the lead by not talking about visually one of the coolest games I've ever seen in my life. Like, I swear to God, Kyle, if you recorded a Let's Play of this game, you could submit it um, and it would be the best animated short for the Oscars. Like, it is <laughs> ridiculously cool looking. Um, it kind of, yeah, it, it reminds me of like the, the um, this is maybe a stretch, but you know, like the line characters in Soul from Pixar? 
it kind yeah. of I reminded- thought of Soul too. Like as yeah. soon as like I started playing, my whole family was like, "This looks like Soul," but they had again had a very different takeaway from it. But yes, I did feel like those parallels were accurate. Yeah, it's like it's such an abstract style. Um, there is literally a scene, light spoilers later in the game, where a character just fully takes their pants off. But it's so stylized that it's still a T rating. But it's like there's multiple times where it's just dropping trout. It's like, okay, that's how you know this when is When I get ours. to that early on, there's like that completely naked woman. And I was like, yeah. whoa, like, you know, it's seven in the morning. Like, what's going on? <laughs> uh, there's a, w- yes, what is this game? Uh, yeah, what is it is a good question. So it sets up the idea of, oh my God. All right. Uh, pray for me, everybody. Try to explain Genesis Noir. It starts out like very film noir vibes. There's even, I think, a, a reference to like Grim Fandango early on with like Manny's Cafe or whatever. Um, but then you see the femme fatale and there's a guy that's shooting her with a gun, but the, ex- <laughs> oh my God. But the explosion of the gun becomes the big bang. And then the framing of the game is the gun is being fired at this lady but then the projectile of the bullet is spreading out. And in that spread, there is the history of the entire universe that you then play through. So it's like, oh, that's what I'm playing. OK, so it's so freaking weird. But it's like, yeah, film noir, but also very space and physics heavy. And each chapter is exploring a different aspect of either physics, space or human history it's it's kind of everything in one um indie game yeah it's some indie crap you know how it goes um <laughs> it's it's absolutely wild like I, it's one of those playing throws like wow i cannot be believe a game can be like this it's so nice to still be surprised by the you know artistic capacity and potential of games but kyle well hold on did you play do you remember that game kids yes it's yeah yep. is it I, is it kind of like that in terms of genre, maybe? I it's it's a cousin. It's kind of the kid's okay. cousin, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Right. For just I mean, I think it I think it tries to do that. Like again, I did not have the uh like it is very stylish. And that was my definitely like my first reaction I was like, oh, and then my second reaction was like jazz. I started thinking of uh Ape Out immediately because it's the only other game I can think of that has jazz. <laughs> Though Dreams has a lot of jazz too. The it, campaign. Does, it reminded me of Dreams' campaign, totally. Yeah. Um, and then also I thought of the soul stuff because like there are parts of soul that get very trippy. Um, I think for me, like an actually I don't think I got the full hour in with Jazz Noir. I'm like, I'll just go back to Narita Boy. It was it <laughs> I think the thing for me is it was a little too far into the it was like, can games be art the game a little bit, which, I tr- you know, I don't want to be too I don't want to I don't want d- to drill into this too much because, uh-huh. you know, games are hard to make. And clearly a lot of time and effort went in here. I think it was going so much for experiential that um, the overarching story it is telling, which is, you know, based on the description, it's like, OK, it's uh, you're in a um what do they call it a lover a lover's triangle or whatever of like between the universe like the big bang and something else like i think that kind of got lost in the weeds which can be okay like sure i've played games where i don't really fully know maybe like the metaphorical meaning or like i'm not getting all the pieces i think that's totally fine most people don't even finish games so you kind of have to make them where they're good no matter what the duration is but for me it was just a little bit too experiential i think again with early on it was very, it started off very grounded. Like you start off, you're like hustling watches. You go back to your apartment, you see a phone number on the ground. You're dialing in the phone on a rotary. It has like some nice point and click moments of like, cool, I'm dialing. Like it, it's fun as hell to swirl that like little rotary phone. So it has that going for it, which is nice. But then it gets so um, experimental without having grounded me in a reality that it kind it, of immediately gave me that disconnect. Sure. So then once I started kind of continuing, it also le- falls into that, trapping of when you're doing things in a game but you don't know how you're doing them and this, you're kind of like you know like with the yes. they have a part where you're tuning like a radio to grow a plant and i did kind of start to see like what i needed to do but it was just like uh you know it, it was just kind of middling i think it was very stylish looking right, um, extremely right. beautiful great music but um in terms of was this a fun game to play or one that was like engaging narratively or you know i feel like it was a lot of uh sparklers but not a lot of substance 
for me personally. Yeah, I guess if but thinking about it. I definitely about... think it's the game that you could, you know, fall for. Like, I saw a lot of really good reviews of this. Like, I looked yeah. it up right after. I'm like, did people like this? But here you are. <laughs> so there are people that, that were really drawn to it for sure. I guess if, like, the nature of the history of the universe isn't enough substance for you, Janet, then I guess that <laughs> rings true. But it, yes. I, I think... guess if they could show me that that was what we were looking <laughs> I'm like, all I saw was, like, I went to this girl's apartment. She was naked. Someone shot her. I was like, what's, you know. Um, I totally. And I, I do play a lot of funky stuff, but it, it was a little. It's funky is a good way to put it yes. for sure. And I totally hear you that, like, you know, to have an adventure game where you're kind of clicking through and trying to figure out, okay, literally, what do I need to click through here to actually make the next bit of progress? And when you're doing that in a surreal environment, it can kind of be like, okay, am I clicking on this swirly thing to progress or this swirly thing? But yeah, Jeff, the, there were multiple points where I was. Where I was clicking around, I'm like, what is the back button in this game? Because I, I feel like I've clicked on everything in this screen and nothing is happening. So how do I get back out? It's the the uh, kind of star void explosion from the gun was one where I was sitting there for a couple minutes. Yeah, you kind of got to go the opposite way. This and I'm not, I can't figure out. I think, too, it yeah. could have benefited a lot from... Um, Maybe just a little bit, a little bit, funny enough, a little bit more text. I know I just complained about text, but no. it's got to, you know, these things need to be done. The, well, yeah, it would take some of the mystery, but they did have some immediate text at the beginning that like set the tone of like the universe and questioning the universe. So why that was effective was because even though it didn't tell me anything about the game, I'm suddenly selling watches. I'm already thinking about the big bang and the universe. So then when I start to see surrealist things, I'm like, cool, I can connect that thread. Right. So I think it needed a few more just like flashes of, narrative tone setting sure. to kind of make me connect the dots, I yep. think, would have would have gone a long way. Yeah, I can see that. Genesis Noir is the name of that thing. It's on everything except for PlayStation, I think, and it's like 12 bucks on the eShop right now. But I guess, yeah, you got to be into a little abstract art. It's made primarily by Feral Cat Den, who I guess is mainly into like, you know, 3D animations and stuff like that. So very much go into it with that that sensibility. This is a game made by an animator and it really shows. Like, I really think any chapter of this game would be the coolest sequence in any other game. And it's just a extended string of it. It's wild. It's also published by Fellow Traveler, which made game like published games like Paradise, Neo Cab, uh, The Stones of the Wind, uh, oh, okay. Paradise Killer, I mean. So like they I think if you look at that suite of games, it just kind of speak towards some of the the tonal uh, things that are happening in this game. Yeah, totally. Um, hey, all so right. We, we talked about you reference soul a lot. I know. Can I tell you my big uh, thing, my revelation that I learned from listening to the director's commentary for Soul? Yeah. John Ratzenberger is in the movie. He's a physical person walking around in the subway. That's how really? he's in the movie. Isn't that Does weird? he say anything? <laughs> no. Wait, so it is the first movie then that doesn't have his voice? The first Pixar? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's But really he's the, he's in it. He's a person in the subway. Wait, they modeled him? They didn't have live action people in that, did they? No, they modeled like a, a young John Ratzenberger that uh, <laughs> he he hits in the shoulder as he runs through the subway. That he turns so around. Weird, what? Uh, yeah. Any other insight? Is it just is it Pete Doctor and Brian Kemp? Is that his name? Yeah, the two. And then there was a third writer. Kemp Powers. It was That's interesting. Right. It was it was good commentary, but I don't I don't have any other specific call outs. But it was it was fun to listen to how how that film came to exist and how quickly uh, Pete Doctor started like sort of playing with the ideas after Inside Out, like, released. Like, it was really directly a product of Inside Out more than I sort of thought. It, and he it, talked about the original versions and how different it was. So, all good stuff. Oh, that's nice. Um, well, hey, speaking of making of stuff, Kyle, let's just keep it mm -hmm. in this vein. Did you listen to that Eric Wolpa podcast? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's it's cool that he won that contest as the biggest Sunset Overdrive fan to talk to Ted Price. <laughs> okay, we got to set this up. Okay, so there is a podcast called Game Maker's Notebook. Um, it's has a rotating host every once in a while, but primarily it's Ted Price, the head of Insomniac, interviewing other game developers. Um, and on the most recent episode, he interviewed Eric Wolpa, who wrote, you know, Portal uh mainly portal psychonauts um but one of my favorite people in the industry uh and he has never really done that many interviews which is frustrating like every glimpse or every like little tidbit of development i always get from eric, eric wolpaw feels like something to cherish so i was so excited to listen to this podcast and yeah it turns out he primarily didn't want to talk about portal and, and developing games at valve he just wanted to talk about sunset overdrive from insomniac and how freaking cool it was yes. tried to get himself a job he's like you guys if you guys work on the sequel 
I will write gags for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's like, I will write for it for six days or some weird thing like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, super fun. Like, you know, he lived in Minnesota for a while. He mentioned Minnesota at some point. Um, <laughs> but I like him, yeah, trying to convince Ted Price. He's like, come on, it's time to take a Spider-Man. Go make Sunset Overdrive too. But the crazy thing that I learned, and I feel like there was a debate about this before, but I learned from the podcast for sure that it turns out uh, Insomniac does own Sunset Overdrive. So that would mean at this yeah. point that Sony fully owns Sunset Overdrive. And Ted Price is very cagey about like, maybe we do something in the future. I don't know. But who knows when they'd ever have time to get off yeah. the but Marvel I, ship. He's really funny. It was awesome to hear his sort of trajectory. I like he I, I, one of my favorite stories that he shared was like working on Half-Life Alex and the character dog. Uh, Alex is a robot. Yeah. Uh, how they were how they were trying to integrate. Uh, that character into the game in some way just there was like a, an easter egg or a reference to it and they modeled it and he's like I and, he, and it was, it, but it came out so late in the development of Alex that the, like the developers were like we do not have time to implement this even if it's just a little figure that you interact with and Eric Wolpaw apparently was like I will personally give you $5,000 uh, Valve developers if you can put this in the game <laughs> and they're like no, we can't do that. We do not have time to do this. <laughs> and so they just like put a picture of dog apparently in that game. But yeah, I love that. And yeah. then they talk about like, you know, is that a good way to go? Because he's arguing like, I think that's a good way to go from game development. Like if you feel that passionately, this feature needs to be in, just open up your wallet and offer the other <laughs> developers money for it. And what's fun is then they talk about like, maybe there's some sort of like virtual currency we can use to simulate that. And then on Twitter, uh, John Shiring, uh, who I interviewed uh, on our YouTube channel, he mentioned, he said, back on Modern Warfare 1 and 2 at Infinity Ward, he said, we did have virtual dollars to spend on a list of potential features, basically anyone's idea for anything. It was great at measuring appeal, but brutal for things important to small departments. Like, FX just got crushed, apparently. So mm. it, other studios have tried that idea of, like, a currency for how badly you want your idea to be implemented, but I thought it was really fun. So, yeah, you can check that out. as the Game Maker's Notebook podcast. Uh, and, yeah, he yeah, talks about... Good developing portal and writing portal and just how much he loves yakuza which is very fun to hear also he, yeah hades he also talked about like recent games that he's kind of enjoyed the interesting narrative approaches to hate there was hades and edith finch made him sick apparently so i wasn't able to finish that <laughs> right right which is a real bummer i wanted to hear his thoughts on that and the weird thing is he was, he was praising this game called isle uh that sam barlow made back in 1999 um you know her story creator and telling lies um but I completely missed that. It's like a text adventure that's all in one aisle of a supermarket, but it has like apparently a ton of different avenues to explore, even in this very limited space. And I feel like it's kind of, you know, it's like an artsy craft that I'll have to check out at some point. Um, just like Bal and Wonderworld, from the creator of Sonic the Hedgehog, this new 3D platformer published by Square, Kyle. Yeah, I mean, we, we do not have to spend a lot of time on this, but like I have been just absolutely fascinated by that game since it was first announced like i feel like when it was announced it didn't really no one really latched onto it or thought it was weird but there's a shot in that announcement trailer of a kid and a farmer just like gently walking towards each other that i was just like what the hell is this game it's so yeah. weird and like playing it has only just made it more confusing like it's one thing to play a game that's like clearly had a limited budget and there's all these shortcomings and you're like well you know that's it is what it is. They tried to get as much done as they could on the budget they could. But this this game feels like it has a big budget, but just has like so many odd choices and it's just so bizarre. It has these like a bunch of like fully animated CG cutscenes when you beat every level that tell these like weird stories. Like the first one's about a farmer who can't grow crops and then you like do a dance together and you can grow crops. The second one is like this woman who is like a diver and her friend who is a dolphin gets mad at her and attacks her and she's in the hospital but then they reconcile by the end after you beat the boss it is so weird it's such a strange game and like i i have some affection for knights in particular yeah um it, it's not a game i ever like owned or beat but it was one of those like those examples that everyone has where they were like you play it at a friend's house in just like maybe like one or two big sessions and it's just like sort of sticks in your brain and this really has a lot in common with Knights in that it just feels like a strange dream. It's so weird. I, I don't even know who it's for because as I'm playing, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, maybe this is for really young kids. Like maybe that's what right. they're going for. It's like, there's a lot of fun mascot characters from the creator of Sonic that literally dance 
Like when you enter a new area and hit a checkpoint, there's a row of characters that are just dancing. You can't interact them with them or anything. They just dance around. But then there's all these moments where like I'm dying during boss fights and the platforming's kind of hard. And I'm like, I who is I? It's I don't for, know what this game is. It's, it's for people so that are nostalgic strange. about Sega's 3D games, 3D platformers. It, is that the yeah? <laughs> exactly. I mean, it feels like like a Sega Saturn game in right. a lot of ways. You know, but with like. I it's I hesitate to say like modern visuals. <laughs> right. Maybe like twenty eighteen visuals. <laughs> like maybe that's being too generous. But I think that's being too generous. I, I played like the first oh, the other weird thing, Hanson, is I beat the first three levels. Yeah. And then like I just had to wait for like a ticker to go up to like a certain number. Like I there's these little creatures right. that you feed crystals to, and the fourth level didn't open up. It just it's like, all right, wait for that ticker to reach uh, seven seventy five. So, and I was at like 520 and I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to go make dinner and just leave the game on, I guess. Like, <laughs> So Bell and Wonderworld, it seems like it's getting just wrecked out there review wise, but it's just one of those the, anomalies that's at least looking worth looking at. The one article that I saw said that it was getting review bomb now with positive scores, <laughs> <laughs> which is like the first time I've ever heard of that happening. Is this going to be the new knack? You know how people yes. never shut up about knack? Is this I mean, gonna? Are we gonna be like five years from now, being like Balan Wonder World two when? Like, is that gonna happen? Yeah, I mean, I I would always talk to when I worked at GameStop. I'd always talk to uh, my friend that worked there, uh, Aaron, and we would talk about games like, hey, remember that games? Like yeah. the example I always use was Odama for GameCube, which was like, uh, do you remember that game? It's like you, it's a pinball game, but you're like managing armies and you use right. a microphone to like activate the paddles, and it's like a weird game that like everyone's kind of gonna forget but in like five years it'll be on the tip of everyone's tongue and like no one's gonna remember the name Balan Wonderworld because <laughs> it is just so weird and it's like I don't know I, I'm not the kind of person who plays games or watches movies that are bad to sort of like revel in how bad they are like, right. I don't like doing that but this I was just like I just had to experience some of it just because I was so fascinated by what this thing is supposed to be and I'm all the more confused after spending a good like three four hours with it yeah anyways uh, I mean you wouldn't recommend it to a single living soul, right? No. Although okay. someone on Twitter did say that they played it with their kid and 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 they loved it. Like the kid really loved it. So there's like there is a demo. Like play the demo. <laughs> and either just be fascinated like I was or immediately delete it and uh, you, you can go from there. <laughs> oh boy. Bell and Wonder World everybody. All right, Kyle, we'll let you get back to playing that. You want to clap out of here? Yeah. Bell and Wonder World. Woo! Surreal Vasquez, welcome to the show, sir. Hi, great to be here. <laughs> oh, how's your day going? Uh, it's okay. Uh, not much has been going on, but it's mostly a lot of boring, like, maintenance stuff. Maintenance? Well, just like, okay, I need to make sure I check the mail and, like, do this other, like, it, it hasn't been an eventful day for that gaming. That pesky existence. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> I'm just Checking living. the mail does not count as maintenance. <laughs> well, I'm checking the mail... <laughs> I'm checking the mail That's for a, mail for a document that I need to do like registration stuff. So it's like, it's just uh, look, the point surreal is that you've been playing monster on her rise. Yeah. Not so much today, but like, uh, yeah, I've been playing, I've played quite a bit of it. I'm on the, for the, for people who haven't playing, I'm about to enter the five star rank. Okay. Hunts, which are still what is, kind of, what does that mean? Like hours wise? I don't know. Maybe something like, 10 12 hours because I've, I've been splitting my time between like so one thing they do now is that they have village and hub quests and the village are basically single player quests and the hub quests are co-op quests right uh so i've been kind of splitting my time between both of those but yeah i've been i've been playing i would say about a thousand or so hours okay here's blanket warning for everybody <laughs> We're not gigantic Monster Hunter fans. I liked World and Surreal. I think you're kind of in my camp of you liked World. Yeah. So we are not hardcore did, Monster Hunter experts. I did too. All right, and Jeff, I'm like World as well. Look, I'm just saying. I don't know why easy. you're so terrified of because Monster Hunter Because I know fans. those what Monster Hunter gonna fans. Do to you? They're going to leave mean comments because it's going to be It can be, be like, worse than like oh. the Pokemon Sword and Shield release. Like the whole... <laughs> You're right, I guess, the national decks and stuff. But Janet, what's your what's your Monster Hunter history? Yeah, I have I have no history, so it's Ooh. nice, short, and sweet. I have no Monster Hunter history. Uh, admittedly, I didn't put, like, a whole lot of time into Rise yet. I only, like, just got through, like, initial tutorialization stuff, which still 
took a while because they have character customization. So, you know, I sat on that screen for like a good a good chunk of time. Yep. Like yep. I literally I literally searched good dog names to name that that dog <laughs> that you get. I'm not lying. I was embarrassed. I shouldn't have shared this with anybody. Yeah. Um what's the dog's name? What is the best dog's name? Oh, um shoot. I can't remember now. What? Bubba, I think. Bubba. All right. It's Bubba. The dog is named Bubba and the cat is named Bruce. Okay. Because my cat Janet, is named Bruce. Janet, I do that all the time too. I whenever I have to name a character, I'm like, good character names, and then <laughs> just scrolling through lists. Jeff, yep. um, yeah. got it. Uh, Surreal, since you played the most, what do you think about Jeff from underscore dog? <laughs> <laughs> I named uh, all my animals after just this cast. Yeah. Smart, yeah, dog one. Uh, I I like it quite a bit. Uh, I think that, like Janet mentioned, I think there is still that hump of uh there's a lot of info early on about well, how do i do this thing and the game doesn't really communicate that stuff super well there are like it it does have all that info you just have to dig for it and it doesn't surface it super well so that yeah. hump I, I think is still there but i think it does do a lot of things uh to help uh people just get into the game quicker which is i think it's this is actually a a better monster hunter for people who have some experience than it is for complete newbies. Cause like, yeah, I don't know that like I'm super versed in, in monster hunter stuff, but I know enough to like, okay, I know that each weapon has this very specific move set and you can't just like be mashing the one button. Like they have a whole like list of things that you need to do. So this, the, the weapon that they kind of stew you towards without telling you that there are 14 other kinds of weapons is the long sword. And so even the longsword has this system where like you you as you use attacks, you charge a meter and you use that meter to charge another meter that increases the amount of damage you do. And then you can cash in that meter to do. So there's like a whole rotation of things you have to do. The game doesn't really tell you that. Yeah. Um, so I think that if you're coming into this game, you should probably still like anytime you have a question, like just Google it immediately. Don't try to look for it in the game because <laughs> um, there's like just things like. Uh, the training area where where I wanted to figure out, okay, what are the swords moves? They they have this fast travel menu and it was like grayed out. So I thought, okay, at some point that'll unlock and it just kept not unlocking. And so eventually I realized that like, you just have to go to that place physically in the map before it'll let you fast travel to it. So there's just a lot of stuff there. But um, overall, I like this quite a bit because of it just feels like Monster Hunter Turbo in a lot of ways. Okay. Um, because like all the hunts are much faster. So um, what they've done is they've basically kind of made the lows lower, but I think they've also made the highs a little lower as well. Oh, the lows higher and the highs lower. So they kind of brought, they've like narrowed kind of the experience a little bit. So like the lows are higher because, you know, you're not hunting down the monster as much. So when you load into a hunt, there's just basically like two to three question marks on the map. And those are the monsters you're going to. And so that you and you can like pinpoint them so that you're always following them. There's not like the fireflies thing of like, okay, like, you know, follow these little signs right, and you get to the right. monster. You can also just basically ride your uh, Palamute, which is a dog, and you just ride it super quickly. Like you get you get to the part where Bubba? you're fighting a monster. <laughs> yeah. You ride your Bubba uh, to the monster much more quickly. So the fights just end up happening a lot more quickly, uh, which I think is good. Um, so like that stuff is really cool because like I'm just n knocking out these hunts like much more quickly and, and because they've you know they have these village quests that are specifically designed single player hunts those are meant for one person so the hunts go by a lot more uh, a lot more quickly like I'm, I'm yeah. taking down like big monsters in like under 10 minutes uh, so it's you know which is a, a good thing to have in a portable game right like yeah. a, a, to, to knock out these hunts and they also have these hunts where it's just go go hunt stuff go look at explore the map a little bit pick up resources so that stuff i think is really cool but i i feel like so far there has been less satisfaction of like i finally took down the monster because there isn't that build up but i think it works here because it is a portable title because it is kind of like I like it as an alternative, but I don't know that, you know, especially for like longtime Monster Hunter fans, I, I can totally see why people would be kind of turned off by how expedited a lot of this stuff is. But I mean, but, eventually it's going to get harder for you, right? Yeah, I like once I get to high rank, I'm sure it'll be like, you know, a bunch of, you know, they've already introduced like the big bad like monster that you're kind of working your way up to. And then eventually, yeah, you're going to be doing repeat hunts where you're, you're like, OK, great. I finally got the one like pelt that I needed to get from this uh, monster to, you know, complete my armor set. 
Um, but right now it just feels like, okay, that thing's down, kill that thing, kill that thing. Um, so like I've been having a, a lot of fun with it more so than, than world for sure. But I'm very curious to see if I tap out more quickly because it's like, okay, I get it. By the time I get to high rank, I'll just be like, I've killed all the monsters. I don't know if I want to go back and do the high rank versions of yeah. them. Is anybody playing with other people? Is everybody playing solo? I'm solo for now. I do plan to go with other people. Um, my friend Kelsey, who, you know, people listening might know her from the Video Game History Foundation or co-owner of Pink Gorilla Games. Yeah. Uh, she loves Monster Hunter. And it's one funny thing about this. And like, you know, it, it's funny because Ben, you opened with like, ah, like, don't don't attack us for like don't maybe not being us. in love with this game. But I, don't, I get like mixed vibes from the Monster Hunter community. I definitely think like any community, there can be hostility uh, just from a number of sources. But I, I do feel like a lot of the Monster Hunter fans I personally know, uh, who are obviously also friends, uh, just genuinely love the game and want people to mm. come in. They're like, please do the work. I promise it'll be worth it. You know, I did a couple of posts on Twitter about uh, my super, super, super early impressions. Again, really just did the tutorial. And I'm like, man, it's a lot of menus. I don't know if I want to do all this. And people are like, wait for it to click. click. Like, people kept repeating right. that phrase. Like, when it clicks for you, like, you'll lose your soul to this game and stuff. Yeah. I'm like, uh, you know, once you shake a poor sinner's hand type meme situation. And um, so for that being said, like I have people that love the franchise and very much want to take me through this game. So I do plan to do that, but I'm kind of um, curious to continue a little bit longer by myself because I do think in, in order to not to be a good game, but I think it is always good for a game to be able to take a player through it and like teach you how to do it totally. um even if and you know i get that like may monster is not the best at doing that but i'm like cool how how bad is it though or how good will it be like what can i get through uh, how much do i really need to focus on it i think that is part of like getting to know the franchise and seeing what is this like for new i mean someone was the first person to play monster hunter right everyone <laughs> like so many people say that you need someone there God. to take you through yeah. it um and what's funny is like i had posted like the next day like a lot of y'all are saying that like i need someone to take me through it and i feel like that's kind of a flaw in the franchise if that's true and then suddenly a bunch of people were like oh you don't need anybody we never said that <laughs> so i i think that that's kind of funny too there are like i've gotten both opinions um someone's i'm sure no one thinks they're lying but someone might be uh but but either way i, I think there's a lot of passion behind uh those who do love the franchise who do see the value who want people to wade through the, the the steep learning curve to get to the other set uh, other end and uh for me i kind of liken this to my difficulty with board games personally mm. i enjoy board games i'm starting to get into them because of quarantine i'm like i need to do something with other people that isn't just staring into your eyes and talking to them mm -hmm. and also isn't staring into a screen what can we do together you know to hang out and that's been board games for me during quarantine and my number one beef with board games because i am i'm going to like them because i like games so it's not surprising but there's a there can be a lot of rules to like read through and it's often very like stiffly written and delivered. So like um, hearing someone talk about explaining what Monster Hunter is or reading through the menus in Monster Hunter, my brain just starts to like yeah. delay, like my eyes glaze over. Totally. And it's like, and then take this to the other thing. You will equip one of what I'm like, nope, nope, I can't, I can't do it. It has to be explained a different way. And obviously there's plenty of resources with like YouTube and lots of, you know, there are people that just only make Monster Hunter content. So that's there for sure. But um, that's been my challenge so far because when it is too utilitarian in the direction set, I have a hard time like processing it. So um, I've done the tutorial and they were like, oh, you know everything you need to know. And I'm like, do I though? No. Because I kind of <laughs> stabbed this small creature eight times with my long sword swinging rapidly with no abandon. So yeah. I'm not sure how much I really retained from those early tutorialization. I'm still also getting used to like where things are with like, button mapping and like you can quickly i actually drink like three potions already so i'm kind of concerned but um I, i'm gonna stick with it and see what see what it's like because i would like to finally get to know uh what this franchise is about and yeah. at least kind of see where i land on it a little bit uh yeah, more you deeply. just you need that you need that coach i think it just it completely changes how you're experiencing the game but yeah jeff i'm so we're in the same camp of liking world but still intimidated like i still feel like I don't know anything about Monster Hunter and I've put what 30, 40 hours into Monster Hunter World. I just feel like a complete idiot. Yeah, yeah. And it and I I kind of went into this one thinking like, oh, okay, I'll be able to handle this because I I kind I more or less learned the ropes with the world. Right, and right. This one it I guess the first thing that I was surprised by was just how much 
how big this game is and how deep it ended up being. Like a- after they kind of streamlined world and made it a little more newcomer friendly, this one feels like, okay, now you've got these monsters you can ride and now you have this other companion animal. And then there are these weird glowing hummingbirds that will give you different kinds of buffs. And like, right. there are so many extra systems that I, I either just don't remember from world or that are new in this one, the whole, uh, you know, grapple hook thing. Yeah. It's like there's there's still so much more to learn on top of the other things. And yeah, none of that has been tutorialized well enough. And I, I totally I can totally sympathize with the developers because they're fans. Like it must be grueling if you're a Monster Hunter fan to have to go through like those tutorials totally. every time. I'm sure you're like, yeah, I know what an insect glaive is. You don't have to explain this to me. Uh-huh. But it's it's a it's been a rough onboarding but i but i'm also like it's super cool to have a game that is this big and this deep in you know a little handheld mode yeah. right i think that that to me I, I wouldn't call it like accessible but i feel like it's a little bit more uh forgiving in that like with world they they maybe had more elaborate tutorials but they were also longer winded and they were kind of you know further couched in like well we want to have a like a narrative like a single player game would and so there were just like a lot of cutscenes and stuff and it was kind of difficult to just get it into a hunt with friends uh not that this game it makes it super simple but it just felt like okay it, it felt like the process of learning the game felt a little bit more elaborate And so I think that's just one of many things that I think could add up. So like, oh, I don't know how this weapon works. Like, oh, I've watched like 10 cutscenes and I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, And like this hub is huge. I don't know where anything is. And I think maybe there's maybe no one thing about Monster Hunter that is like so off putting that you you would just like stop playing immediately. But I think it ends up being like, okay, I had this session. What happened in like in that hour? I think Rise is a lot better about like you fought like three monsters versus like well, you fought one thing, you explored the hub, and you watched the cutscene that, yeah. you know, like the story wasn't that great. So I think them kind of cutting out a lot of that, like, intermedi- intermediary stuff of, like, letting you just fast travel and, like, your room basically acts as, like, the catch-all menu for everything, um, I think makes it a lot easier to stick with it versus, like, it won't teach you the game. Like, you should still totally just hit up an online tutorial and, like, whatever weapon you end up picking, just Google a video about how that uh that weapon actually works but i think once you have that i think it's a lot easier to to not get so bogged down in a bunch of the other stuff that like even world had so i think it has made it for me a lot more approachable and like i think about my sessions with monster hunter less is about like well i'm gonna have to do all this stuff to set up before i can actually get into the hunt and more like okay i'll spend a bunch of time fighting you know a platypus frog that uses a bunch of sumo techniques and that's really cool you know like it might be a little difficult and you still have to get used to like the the way monster hunter attacks it's like you can match x and if your pace fate like you can just whiff attacks completely and there's no like auto correct for like i'm you know the analog stick is facing forward why am i attacking backwards right uh, so that stuff is still going to be a lot of a lot of like muscle memory that you're going to have to get used to but i i still think that you know it, it's a, it's a lot faster it's a lot more approachable and i think that makes it not like i said accessible but kind of easier to get over that hump yeah Monster Hunter Rise, everybody. I mean, it, believe it or not, it's as we talked about last week, it's selling like hotcakes. What, they're up to, what, 4 million sold or shipped? I forget exactly the way they, they phrased yeah. that, but it's just bonkers. I, yeah, and I feel like a lot of the conversation has been like, well, it's like, you know, it, it's like if we were talking to you about like the, the mechanics of like learning to play gu- guitar, but we didn't talk about how fun it is to play guitar and how <laughs> satisfying it is, right? right? The strings like, hurt. I, I think it is <laughs> worth it, right? Like because you know, I, I mentioned how the systems of the of the long sword work, but it is really satisfying because like once you get up to max level or whatever, you can do a thing uh, called like the the spirit helm breaker, where you just like launch yourself up in the air, do this like super powerful attack, and there's like a delay where you land, and then all these like damage numbers come out of the screen, and it's like ridiculous. Yeah. Or and then I also use the hammer, where like you know one like you have different charge levels on that as well, and you just do this like jumping move where you just turn into like a like basically like a a buzz saw with your hammer, like and you just like like boom 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 like hit the monster a bunch of times on the way down, and like the hammer specifically, like you want to mash this monster in the face as many times so that you can stun it, which you can't do with a lot of other weapons. So like you can hit them so hard in the head that they get stunned. Right? Right. Yeah. Um, so I think it is really cool. And I, I 
like even the hub quests, which are the co-op quests, I found a lot more approachable because it's like, okay, you are joining this thing. It is, you know, sending out the signal to like, come join your quest. So you'll start the hunt by yourself, but randoms will just populate eventually. And there's just like this field of like, okay, there's four people, like it's stunned. Now, like, because I use my hammer, now there's like four people and four dogs just like beating up on this giant like bat uh for for like you know 30 seconds straight and it feels really cool yeah um so so it's it it is fun once you get that hump i think i think that's the thing i want to communicate is i'm having a ton of fun with this game but you know come in with like some expectation that you'll have to you know there are things to get used to but it is really really cool yeah okay but close your eyes right now surreal just relax Mm -hmm. give me the completely accurate prediction of where monster hunter rise will be on your top 10 list and this is final. Oh, you don't uh, relax enough. Yep. I'm going to say, oh man, I'm getting all this. Uh, I'm going to say five. Five. All right. There it is, everybody. Yeah. Um, hey, Jeff, do you know how this whole thing operates? Uh, pet, 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 what are, where pedicure.net everybody yes uh patreon.com slash max with two n's uh that's how we're able to keep growing and bring on wonderful people like janet um also there's a weird thing where i tweeted out uh from the max account like hey what's confusing about our patreon because i feel like it's so easy to overlook confusing things when i'm so zoomed in and all things Max patreon and a lot of people were like it's really weird that your podcast is behind the patreon paywall it's like, no, 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 it's not. Like, if you're watching the video version of this, you can subscribe to the Midmax Show podcast. Uh, early access is a benefit on Patreon. You can watch us live for the earliest access on Patreon. But just in case you're watching this and didn't know that you could listen to this in a standalone podcast feed for free, you can do that. So we appreciate that subscription as well. Also, thanks to another Eden on Steam now. This is the game from Masato Kato, who is the writer for Chrono Trigger, the writer and director for Chrono Cross. I interviewed him a couple weeks ago here at MinMax, uh, but they want everybody to know that another Eden is now available on Steam. It was on mobile for so long, and I started it. It is so nice to play this thing off of the phone and to have like a new JRPG on Steam. Here's the thing, free to play? but I promise it will not infuriate you. Uh, it is shockingly unobtrusive with the microtransactions. It's like, basically, you remember in Chrono Trigger um, and the end of time, Jeff, um, is it Balthazar that's in the end of time? Basically, that guy is still in that type of world and you can go there and unlock new characters if you want. But otherwise, like the main story is still hundreds of hours and it is just a JRPG that's free on Steam. And so it's, it's cool to check out. Um, what have you got to lose? Go check it out on Steam. You can follow the link in the description, which is bit.ly slash minmax. So thanks for checking that out and uh, help show that there's an audience for more JRPGs on Steam by checking out another Eden from Chrono Trigger's writer. Um, also, thanks to Will Cornelius. Uh, they want everybody to know that if you own an Android or Tizen OS smartwatch or looking for a unique watch face with a retro sci-fi or futuristic design, you can download the Facer app to your smartphone and check out creator Cyberpunk. It's over 100 original watch faces featuring neon and metallic backgrounds, unconventional time and date settings, dynamic battery life and stat tracking, new series of faces based on Dune's great houses, free and premium faces available for $4.99 a month. Thank you so much for your support, Will Cornelius. We appreciate it. Also, I Am 8-Bit wants everybody to know that Etherborn is on Switch and PS4, and you can get the I Am 8-Bit exclusive edition from their store. This is from Altered Matter and Acapura Games. It comes with the fold-up poster with art by Tony Molly, O Sleeve by Samuel Cohen, reversible cover sheet, and it's region-free. So check out Etherborn at I Am 8-Bit's wonderful online store. Anything you get in that store uh, under $100, you can use the promo code APRILFOOLS. No space. April Fools for 10% off everything in I Am 8-Bit store. So please check them out because they support us in a big way by giving away things every single week on the MinMax Show podcast to our favorite question of the week. And this week, our favorite question submitted by the community on Patreon will receive the Untitled Goose Game vinyl soundtrack, which is a very cool thing. So thanks to I Am 8-Bit. All right, community questions. Janet, you know the drill. Um, People write in, they ask about anything. Sometimes they submit a game question, really anything that makes the show better. And then we choose our number one favorite thing and they get something wonderful. So, you know, look alive and remember each and every question, I guess is is the message for you. Uh, Tommy Carver Chaplin writes in and he says, F yeah, Janet. Yay. So remember that one, put a little... Uh, notch next to that one. Um, Go Fish writes in and says, I know we've been introduced to Janet before, 
But now that we'll be hearing her takes more regularly, it'd be good to hear what genres, games, systems she prefers, and her early gaming background to provide some context. Welcome, Janet! All right, Janet, this is an impossibly big question. <laughs> okay. All right, how All would right. you boil down your taste in games? <laughs> um, man, so many thoughts run through my head. Pro cute games, uh, platformers, story-driven experiences. For some reason, there's a lot of overlap between games I like and games where you play as a literal square. Um, that's <laughs> been a, a trend that's popped up. Um, do I need to go through a list of square games now? Hang on, I'm really, I'm really trying to think. Thomas is alone or whatever. <laughs> Oh, that one too. But like, um, even though I wasn't in love with it, Box Boy, um, there's a, a co-op game. I'm blanking on what it's called, but you like control two cubes. A lot of puzzle games have squares in it too. Uh, yeah, I don't know. There's a long list for some reason. Okay, outside of square of, games. Of those that popped up. Okay, maybe this is a better way to boil it down. This is impossible. <laughs> Do you have your top three favorite games of all time? Um, favorite games? Yeah. Yes. I what do you so, think? Yes. Um, I'm going to go Jack 2. Um, oh gosh, Check Super down. Mario 64. Wow. And, um, oh, favorite games, favorite. Okay, I'm trying to think of like, I think of that in terms of love, not like quality. Though those are both really good games. Yeah. Um, maybe Splatoon 2. Wow. Just because I played that yesterday. Like I had a, I do like goal tracking and I'm trying to like do rewards for when I like hit certain goals. And one of them was to like eat a bunch of pizza rolls and play a comfort food game. And I'm like, what's my comfort <laughs> food game? Uh, which is why I tweeted, what's your comfort food game? And, uh, you know, I think the first thing I thought of was maybe like Yoshi's Island, Jack and Daxter, like the first one uh, and Splatoon 2, because like it just gets you into that that calm meditative, meditative state. Yeah. Um, but I guess to get a little more specific and a little a little more serious or like give you something more tangible. Favorite genres, platformers, uh, action, adventure, adventure puzzle games those are probably my top genres um with uh but i try to dabble into everything i am a firm believer on even if you don't like a genre there probably is at least one game that you would like in that genre so uh, a lot of people sometimes ask why are you playing like this game if you know you don't like that genre um because we never know this could be the one that sparks it for me yeah. or i could just you know learn more about what i like and what i don't like in games you know more about design and all that stuff um other things first system the uh soup the Super SNES, the SNES Junior was my first console that I had access to. Um, my first personal console was also that because it was hand me down from my brother. But we always shared consoles. Grew up playing Nintendo and Sony predominantly. It was all Nintendo. Then Sony came into the folds where I got, I had the PS2 in my room. My brother had the GameCube. I didn't play Xbox until the Xbox One because I didn't have a second sibling. There were only two of us. So when <laughs> Xbox came in, we're like, we're just not going to have those because there's only... We, you got two. You got two. And we were always really friendly. You know, my brother plays a big role in my life. Still, he sometimes is on stream and, and all that stuff. So oh, cool. uh, that's how I grew up playing uh, preferred console. Definitely. I love Nintendo for third party stuff. I was leaning on to Microsoft for a long time, but I am now more a little bit more into PlayStation because that dual sense is fantastic. I think that's the entire gaming history. <laughs> we got it. That's yes. perfect. Seal it. Uh, Seth Hillman Johnson writes in. He says, welcome, Janet. Are any of the cohorts currently... Oh, wait, no, I'm sorry. Hang on. We'll get to this one later. There's another one before that. Crystal Keyframes Animation writes in and says, Hey, Mim Max, if given the option, would you rather be a kid gamer again now? On one hand, you've had the experience of midnight launches, the era of couch co-op and arcades. On the other hand, kids these days have access to most classic games for bargain bin prices, <laughs> don't have to worry about new games, being out of stock, etc. In other words, do you feel like your gaming childhood was better than kids have it today? I think kids no. have it way better today, right? Yes. Yes. I was so like, well, not not poor. We were like lower middle class. But can you imagine having Game Pass as a kid today? It'd like, be ridiculous. Holy cow. Or it's over. Yeah. I mean, today. I spent so not many. Even close. Yeah. I spent so many hours of my childhood, my precious youth, just lost, just Googling for free crappy shareware games and going to like, you know, freegames.net, all these just garbage sites to try and download something that was kind of playable. And the idea of like now getting to play free games that are actually Online solid. Online guides. Yes, exactly. There's so many avenues where it's way better now. Yeah, the, I think it, it it is better as a whole. I, I'm always kind of like, like, would I have found my favorite? I would have, probably have like very different favorite games. So I almost, I don't know that I would go back and be a kid again, but I do totally acknowledge that like kids have it better now. Cause like, you know, what are the chances that kids today like have like, you know, for example, Metal Gear Solid 3, like have <laughs> most kids heard of that game at this point? No. Right? 
And that's just very specific to me of like, I want, I want to like the games that I like uh, and not different ones, you know, like, and, and there's also just a lot of the community stuff of like, I wonder how many, how much kids have to worry about the social aspect of games now of just like, well, I want to play Fortnite, but like how, how much are like personal politics involved of like, well, I have this crew and now like my, like my friend, you know, is with this other crew, but I like, they won't let me in is like how much the like social right. dynamics from school extended to my, into gaming time now. Yeah, and that's just that's just a thing I don't want to put up with. Like I, I would rather like I was totally fine, you know, playing Soul Calibur 2 single player mode by myself <laughs> and not really playing it against other people for a while for for most of my time with it. Yeah, which uh, Soul Calibur 2 that was online, wasn't it? Uh, the the re release was okay. Uh, I think three might have been the first one that was online, and that might have been through the PS2, uh, which is a weird thing, but yeah. yeah. Uh, Jeff, yeah, th- would you rather play Fortnite or Jax or whatever game you were into? Yeah, this this is really just a laugh at how old Jeff is mm-hmm, question. Correct. But no, I I would not change mine because mine was very much the kind of actual old arcade games and NES Super Nintendo era. And yeah. I, I feel like those... I still have so much nostalgia for those games. I wouldn't want to lose them. And it was also, you didn't have like any of the free to play kind of microtransaction problems or, and even like, you know, like the, everything has to be a sequel in a franchise, I guess, you know, like Mario kind of fits in that bill, but those are Nintendo games. So they were always good. And so it was, it was a simpler time way back then. This was also, this was also pre internet, which I feel like, I am I'm very precious about those memories of what life was like before yeah. the scourge of the internet. So I I I enjoyed all of those things having them in my childhood. Yeah, and I mean wouldn't give them give them up. Like what Sorry was saying just about the social pressure and stuff for playing online like I am so thankful every day <laughs> every day. Uh for that fact that like Facebook came around right when I started college. It was like right starting freshman year was like the birth of Facebook. And the idea that I didn't have to deal with any of that in high school where I feel like it would have wrecked me socially and just had it in college where it's like at start, you know, at the beginning, it was like, oh, this is a cool way just to meet new people. Yeah. And and discovering new games was felt super special back then too yeah. because it was like you would read them in Nintendo Power or some kid from school would be like, oh my God, you got to play this game. And then you'd go to a Mr. Movies and you would rent it. And, and you'd Movies? have it for like, <laughs> yeah. it was like Blockbuster. It's like a regional? Blockbuster. Oh no, that's like a time, that's like space and time. Okay. Oh, yeah. so it's like, oh, Blockbuster. That's like the Netflix thing, right? The Netflix movie? Yeah. Oh, okay, got it. Yeah, yeah. Precisely. yeah. Netflix, but it, but it was like a, you walked into Netflix and it was a mm. physical space. <laughs> cool. Essentially. Okay, I know what a rental place is. It's like, it's just, yeah. the, na- the name was new. <laughs> We've uh, all rented stuff in VR. Oh, you don't say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but, but a lot of my, my first gaming memories, because we weren't allowed to actually have an NES, was we could rent one, you know, like every now and then we'd get a weekend where we could rent a console and a couple games for it. And then it was just like a, you know, marathon bonanza of playing games for 72 hours or however long you got them. Right. And that was really special too. You lose, you lose that nowadays as well. Yeah, just lose it. Uh, Seth Zillman Johnson says, welcome, Janet. Are any of the cohorts currently waiting for a game to go on sale before they buy it? Do y'all do that a lot? I find myself constantly putting off games, not wanting to pay full price for them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, constantly. Like I, I, I forgot to bring my Switch like at my desk. So maybe if I log into my te- my Nintendo account, I can see my wish list. I think Nintendo again because that's my one of my favorite, if not my favorite, places to play. Because I just am a huge Nintendo fan. Like I am constantly going on the eShop. Search low to high, you know, Friday night, you get it, get it, crack open mm, a beverage mm. and you just see where the world takes you. You know, I mentioned that I play a lot of like art house things, right? Like I'll, I'll play like pretty much anything that looks remotely interesting. And especially when it comes to like indies and especially on switch, which is like just dominating indie options in a lot of ways, especially by being a handheld, like I'm just constantly going. And if it looks interesting at all, like, Oh, this could be solid. Yeah. I'll put it on the wish list. And then when I, do those runs where I'm looking through more game stats of the wishlist. I also see what's on sale from there. So then sometimes like there's nothing like loading up your eShop account with 10, maybe 15 bucks, nothing crazy. And seeing how many games mm-hmm. that I think will be good. Can I get for this price? 
shopping on the eShop is my game of the year every year. So <laughs> I have a bunch of stuff on my wish list, like at all times. And I've gotten a lot of games like really cheaply for that. You know, Floor Kids has been on there for like three years. Oh, uh, yeah. Child of Light's on there. Four ninety nine dollars right now, by the way. Nice. Don't Starve, uh, Nintendo Edition, four ninety nine dollars currently on sale. Zenbound, it's like a it's like a puzzle game. You like spin stuff. Pinstripe, Lightfall, Moonlighter, Feather, Puzzle Herder. I don't know if these games are good or not, but they look like they have potential. <laughs> so like when the price is right, I'll just, you know, take a flyer. And I find a lot of like, you know, quote unquote, switch hidden gems that way because I take a risk on it. And obviously, like we always have these conversations on like, is it worth this you know amount? And I really try to stray away from that. But like for this, I'm like, OK, look, if we all have budgets and things, it's not that I don't think Moonlighter or Feather or Floor Kids aren't worth 20 or 30 dollars. It's just that I want to see how much I can get for maybe a smaller amount. So I'll just wait for those games to be on sale or maybe I will like buy them anyway but you know i think we've all had those instances of of looking for deals and nothing wrong with that use your wishlist functionality steam has the same thing um you know i got down well for like 99 cents and i never looked yeah. back hell yeah no it's, i'm totally with it. it's the way to go yeah switch was my answer for that too and it, i don't really use that kind of functionality on xbox or playstation like every now and then playstation will say there's a sale and i'll kind of look through what games are there but the for some reason, the eShop, and I do the same, the low to high thing as well. Like there's there's something about the way that shop is set up and the functionality of that wish list where it's it's a much more proactive thing of like, oh yeah, there's this, you know, like Stardew Valley, it's, it's there. I don't know if I want to pay $15 for it again, but I'll just add it on the wish list. And then Nintendo will send me an email someday being like, hey, you got seven dollars. You're spending it now, on um, on this. I just got Galaxy for like three dollars. Oh, other really? Day. So I was like, oh, I, I'll absolutely buy that one again. <laughs> Did you? Then see you get the coins, and then you use those coins to like buy that's more right. stuff that you're not gonna. Yep. That's how they get you. They're giving yeah. it away, y'all. Did you see, by the way, Galaxy? Um, not Team Seventeen. What is their name? That studio. Uh, Seventeen. Seventeen bit. bit. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, did you see their new game? It completely flew on my radar at first, but it's a it is a VR survival game, which seems completely out of their wheelhouse. But I'm excited for it. It's called like Song of the Smoke, I think. Mm. Um, anyways, uh, Ryan Besadney writes in and says, "New voice, sweet." So there you go, Janet. Ryan's a big fan. Yay. Um, Hoots writes in and says, Hello, Min Max, and welcome, Janet. Janet, on a previous episode of the show, you stated you're going to make a conscious effort to stay on top of all new releases this year in order to become an expert in your field. How's that coming along? It's going pretty well. It's not quite as good as it could be because I'm still missing games. A lot of games come out, y'all. Like, have y'all yeah. noticed that? People keep making games. And mm -hmm. then sometimes you don't even know that the game was made. I like Sometimes I see like Fire Games. It's like, oh, this came out two years ago. This is not for this project, but let me wish this did mm -hmm. and come back. Um, but so far I've played, I, I do Game of the Year Watch on my channel uh, every Friday uh, where I'm trying to pick like a recent release. Sometimes I'll put in an old one I missed if there's nothing coming out that week. But uh, this year I've played uh, four hours or more of Sue Me Boy Forever, Scott Pilgrim, which doesn't really count, but like, I don't know. You it count January. It. Sure. Hitman 3, The Medium, Little Nightmares 2, uh, Bowser's Fury from Super Mario 3D World, also doesn't really count, but whatever, uh, Brother Default 2, Loop Hero, uh, and It Takes Two. So I And I just started Monster Hunter Rise, so I gotta work through that. Persona 5 Strikers, I'm saving it because I th I feel like one, you know, I'll, I'll play Persona 5, like I've never played a Persona game, and I want to mm. play 5 before I play Strikers, yeah. but like, am I really gonna play 5? No. Maybe not, but I like to... I, I like to pretend that I'm someone that will do that. Right. So when that person plays five, then I'll play strikers. It's all banking on her. It's, if she gets it together, we'll get strikers in there. But yeah. uh, And then I also played Lemon Cake, that uh, indie game I mentioned before, uh, where you run a bakery. That came out this year. So uh, that's what I have so far. I got a bunch of other ones queued up. I basically keep a calendar and I put down notable release dates in it. And then I like drop them down to like, okay, what am I playing this Friday. So like next month, okay, we got Outriders, Odd World, this indie game called Before Your Eyes might be interesting where you control everything with your voice. Returnal slash Pokemon Snap, like April's probably basically booked for that part of the project. Uh, right. I do intend to go back and finish some of those games, but that's how it's going. It's going pretty well. It is a lot easier when I make my own schedule of content to get to all these, but still very challenging. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's going well. You can um, 
just go ahead and cross off Persona 5. Just let it go. Just, I know we all, it's the future bias thing of at some point I will be a better person and have the time to absorb all of this stuff. But Persona 5 and Strikers just crossed off the list. They're cool. No doubt about it. They're cool. Hit hit me up on social media, y'all listening. What (laughs) lie are you telling yourself about Mm. games? We all have one. At least one. Yeah. What's your lie? Like, let's just all all come clean and be yeah. like, I'm pretending that I'm going to play this or buy this or finish this or platinum this. You're not going to do it, but you can't let it go. You know, yeah. we also have that game installed that you're not going to play. Yeah. Janet, I'd like to make just a confession. I just would like yes. to purge my soul from this one. I um I have the Groundhog Day VR game that came out a couple years ago on my PlayStation. Mm-hmm. I don't think I'm ever going to play that. <laughs> Yeah, and I got Moss on Miraculous Quest. I'm not going to play Moss. Look, nope. it'd be nice. I, but maybe I will. Maybe oh, we could be that person any day. We could become that person. I feel like I had my shot. <laughs> I borrowed Brian Shea from Game Informer's PlayStation VR, and I had it at my house. And I had it plugged in with my PS4, and still I could not build the will to play the Groundhog Day VR. But if you ask me any day of the week, I'm like, oh, you kidding me? Groundhog Day video game? I'm there. Day one. It's like day 512 and I'm still not there. But it's the same day. We don't know. So you're living it. (laughs) Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, I'm getting better every day. That's a great point, Jeff. Yeah, I go really extreme with that. I've even gone as far as to um, like sell like sell a game i'm big on physical media because you can trade in stuff i think it's really convenient lots Mm -hmm. of other reasons too um but like doom vr i think or just one of the doom games i'm like i got it then i'm like i'm not gonna play this sold to gamestop bought it again didn't play it again (laughs) like i'm next level not playing these games i go harder on not playing games than i do on playing games that's how extreme it is i think that's a sign of being a gamer in this day and age yes. is you feel more guilt about the games in your library that you aren't playing than the games you actually have. You just, you can't escape it. Uh, sincerely, Eric writes in, he says, Hey everyone. And especially Janet, uh, strategy guides. When do y'all use them? Is there a plan in your head before starting a game? If you'll go in blind or if you have one from the start, uh, do you just wait to get frustrated before folding in and Googling it? Also, where's your favorite place to get a guide? If they have one for me, it's been polygon. No offense to your former work. Uh, Janet at IGN, <laughs> writing guides. I no longer need to like propel using IGN guides because I don't work there anymore, which is kind of convenient. What um, what was it like writing guides? I cannot imagine oh. any. That is truly the deepest dive. We like to brag that we have the deepest dive here at Midmax, but compared to some people writing those guides, we're amateurs. There's some rough stuff in that pool. I'm not gonna lie. Um, you know, well, to answer the first question, what's it like writing guides? It's um, it's very clerical. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I do find the enjoyment of it. I don't like love it to the point where I want to continue doing it. It's why I'm not just looking for it. I'm sure someone else could hire me to write guides because there's a lot of people that need guide writers. Um, but they also need a lot of people because not a lot of people want to do the work or are good at it. Um, yeah. It's a lot of giving direction sets. I have an education background. I taught high school English for a year. My degree is in secondary education. So uh, I think that lent itself well to explaining stuff. And even now, like when I'm playing just casually, if my family's playing like we're all kind of gamers in this household like everyone except my dad plays games uh pretty actively so you know sometimes i'll need to tell someone to win or go you know we're sitting on a sofa and i'm like okay face this wall turn 180 you're gonna see this thing you know i'm very like good at at navigating that because Uh i have that background um and it's a lot of you know one thing is it's it's writing for both ends like you want to write for someone who is awful at this game can barely play video games like that level. And also someone who is really skilled and just wants maybe like quick information. So like I, you know, did some work on like the Final Fantasy VII remake guide. And a lot of that was like, okay, you want to have like, it differs per game. You'll have like, okay, this is your material that I recommend you have slotted. Uh, this is the kind of like move set you can use. Here's a good place for this thing. Here's a call for this. And you want to make it really skimmable. Like the worst thing about using a guide is when you want, you have one specific question and you can't yep. find the answer easily, you bounce off it like that. So uh, we were always trained to try to, you know, be as thorough, but skimmable. Like you're kind of have wearing all these different hats in terms of how you write it. Um, people always ask, did it make me like hate games more? Or like, I'm, you know, I'm very critical uh, when I have criticisms and people would always say like, oh, it's it's because you wrote guides, like you're too mm. deep into the game. But like, I, I don't think it's necessarily true. I mean, it's definitely a different relationship with games and you get to know a game very intimately. But I don't think it necessarily, I don't think it brought out any negativity that wasn't already there. I'm like, I kind of don't think I'd like Borderlands 3 writing, even if I wasn't <laughs> writing the Killable right, Guide, right, which right. I did write, which was very hard to do. Jeez. Um, but yeah, as far as using them, uh, even though I wrote a lot of guides, I 
I, I'm I'm fine using them. I don't think it's uh, I don't have any qualms about like I don't want to use the guide. Every now and then I decide to do that in a game because I want to challenge myself. I also really want to get better at playing games. Like, geez, I've been playing games since like 1997, and you know I still am not the greatest gamer ever, and I you know I still struggle on puzzles and things. So I think struggling through it instead of looking at the answer can grow you into a better gamer. So that's my only apprehension to using a guide. Um, but definitely not above it. And I, I stream with uh, Backseat Gaming Allowed on my channel. And like, I'll tell people right away, like, all right, y'all, I don't really care about solving this puzzle. Like, if y'all know what to do, let me know. Because like, I literally played the medium for like 20 minutes straight in one room because I was stuck. Yep. And I'm like, that's the same thing as using a guide. But to me, it's a little more fun when like someone that you know directly helps you figure it out. So that's that's kind of the extent of game help that I like going to. We'll definitely open a guide if needed, you know, Animal Crossing, getting dates, figuring out items. Right. Plenty of times, but uh, yeah. Guides are weird because I used to follow, <laughs> I used to be that guy who would just have the strategy guide open and just follow it direction by direction. And I think as I got older, that became less satisfying. So now oh, I'm yeah. kind of like, I have the, a chip on my shoulder about like, I don't want to use guides because I used to use them all the time. So I'm almost like proving to myself subconsciously that I can do it without the guides. Uh, so now I'm kind of less, uh, I'm kind of a little bit hesitant to do it. But for it just depends on the game. I think if it's like a, this is meant to be a challenging thing, I don't want to look it up. But for something like Monster Hunter, I don't think they meant for it to be a puzzle where the training room is or how to access it, right? So that stuff is just like, that's just the detail that I that the game either did not communicate or I missed. Like that's when I'll go to a guide or when it's like collectibles, I'm, I'm pretty big about whenever I do get it in my head to get all of them. I don't, like I have zero qualms about like, well, okay, where's the last one? I don't like, I don't want to bother like running around the map looking for the last collectible. Yeah, I think that's totally reasonable. Yeah, I, I'll use them too when if I if I feel like there's something that I'm going to miss and that I can't go back and get it later or or if there are like story decisions and it's not clear what if it's, you know, if it's going to have a major impact but it's not really telegraphed well what what that is going to be, I will look it up and be like, okay, what's the best choice here? Yeah. And then and then games like Stardew Valley where it's like, what's what can I sell this for? You know, like it doesn't always tell you that kind of information. Like I have told my wife to just look it up on the Stardew Wiki so many times over the past two weeks because she's asking me all these questions. What do I do with this? Where do I get this? And I it's don't like, remember. I don't remember. Just, <laughs> I don't know what you put in your grange for the spring fair. Just like go look up a guide for how to get first place. I don't know what Leah likes. Uh, who can remember such things? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Phil DeGrave writes in and says, Welcome, Janet! I lived in SoCal. This is more of a story, but I like it. I lived in SoCal and recently drove to San Antonio, Texas. By the way, Janet, just brace for impact here. The story is not directed at you. Okay. <laughs> it would be confusing. Wait, why? I'm, now I'm scared. No, you shouldn't be scared, but just like, I, with that setup, it made it seem like this is for you and it's going to make no sense why. Oh. Hey, the point is... Hello, Janet. Oh, okay. Here's my story. Yes. About, yeah. Hello, Janet, and here's my story. I live in SoCal and recently drove to San Antonio, Texas to visit my parents for a week. On the drive back, it's I-10 all the way, pretty much nothing but dry, boring desert. I saw a rather fancy sports car, several of them actually, in a little convoy, all matte black, all very expensive looking. All had GameStop logos painted on the sides along with Wall Street bets. I wonder if this is a group of dudes that struck it rich on the GameStop stock roller coaster. Anyway, one of the cars had a Texas personalized license plate that read anti-lag. Wow. Anti-lag or anti-lag? <laughs> Leg! <laughs> Sorry, yeah, maybe it's a Minnesota accent. Uh, L-A-G. Okay. Yeah. What a word picture. That's really beautiful, isn't it? Just heading out on the highway with the GameStop logo on the side of the car. Who is, I guess if you have that much money, you might as well spend it on something. It might as well be decals and personalized license plates. Yeah, let's know. ruin a sports car. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever run into those weird situations where it's like, it, it happened not too long ago when I was in South Dakota uh, in the Black Hills. And suddenly it was just like, we're on this winding mountain road and then it just started to be the same car passing by and it was like a hundred, you know, I don't know anything about cars. 
Mitsubishis or something. Like it's just like, <laughs> have you ever noticed that like those weird groups that travel in packs mm. with like unified cars? They're weird people. If you're one of those weird people, please write in. I would like to know more about you. <laughs> I'm a weird person. I'd like to tell you. <laughs> yeah. I'm also anti lag. Um, <laughs> Janet, you're from California. No. Where are you from originally? Chicago. Chicago. Okay. Well, I, I didn't even know that. Um, I don't know if it's a Illinois thing, but I forget what game we were talking about on the podcast last week, but everyone was driving home that the Minnesotan, like, bag, apparently we say bag weird, and now I'm up in my head about how we're oh, saying the A's? it. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, like Chicago. Like, people say I say my A's weird, too. Um, okay. I don't know. Serial, can you like, hear it? <laughs> I get complimented on my pronunciation of A's all the time. It happens so often. <laughs> all right. But you don't I, hear I, any, I, like, Minnesotan yeah. accent then? Uh, a little bit. Like, I think some people have it. When, when I was in Minnesota, Minnesota. I feel like some, some people I could <laughs> notice it. Some people, I'd like, I, it didn't really cross my mind at all. But I think it, it just kind of varies. But I don't know that... I, I couldn't put together like a here's the things that Minnesotans pronounce weird. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, we'll there's a lot that. of Midwest accents. Wisconsin, mm-hmm. that's another one. Mm-hmm. It's all excellent. I went yeah. to college in the Midwest too, so like I went to school in Iowa. So oh, I, yeah. got a, I got a lot of Midwest experience. We're at in Iowa. Um, geez, Mount Vernon, Iowa. So uh, 30 minutes outside of Cedar Rapids, which is like the most Midwest sentence <laughs> to say. No, that makes sense. Like oh. You head on down. Our downtown was literally like one to two city blocks. We had three bars in the entire town. Um, yeah. Wait, so what was the college then? It was Cornell College. Not to be confused with Cornell University. Okay. Had that uphill battle for like my whole life. I'm like, no, I did not have, I, I, I mean, I didn't apply. So technically, I, maybe I could have gotten in, but we'll, we'll never know. But probably <laughs> no. Uh, Matter Matters writes in and says, hey, cohorts, question for Janet. What's the hardest part for you about writing and recording solo content? Uh, doing all of it by myself. Um, so eventually, I would love to uh, make more money enough to one comfortably pay my bills, two like comfortably live, three pay people to do the things that I'm not good at doing. So uh, you know, when I would do like the steps to do a review, it's like it's all me. The only the only pro is that like there's no revi- there's no direct revision process because it's me and myself. But you know, I write and then edit it and then bring it down to a script and then put it into Adobe Premiere and use my limited Adobe Premiere knowledge to cut a video. And then, you know, I, like I have to, my website was made in like the dead of night because I'm like, I have a review going up tomorrow and I don't have a website to put it on WordPress template. Like it's uh, it can be kind of chaotic. So that's been probably the biggest challenge. Uh, I am lucky though, in that I have like an incredibly supportive family and household um my boyfriend is like a web developer so like he is working on and he can do some design stuff so he's like gonna help me fix my website like he fixed my god-awful thumbnails <laughs> that i had for the longest my brother's a pretty strong writer too so like i have him edit my reviews just so i can have an editor <laughs> like so you know someone that kind of looks over things um but yeah definitely being the person that does it all the point of contact establishing uh connections in the industry like i've been working in games for about like I think three or four years now, but like, I'm not amazing at every single facet of it. So it's like, oh, I want this game. Who do I talk to? And you kind of right. just, you know, and, and a lot of the games industry is, uh, you know, that's why I have game industry guides, uh, dot com, my like advice blog, because so much of it is like, no one knows and no one talks about it. It can be very difficult to, to navigate. What is it like to really build a career in this industry, especially in the modern era? Because when you talk to a lot of established people, there are people that, you know, no offense, but have like maybe a, a more print background or like an old, like an older background where they weren't on social media. Like I built my entire career in large part because of Twitter and Facebook groups. Yeah. If those things didn't exist. I don't know how I would have broken in. And people who are like, Oh, I don't use social media. Like I've been, I've been writing for 30 years. That's awesome. But like, that's not going to be helpful <laughs> for someone new. So uh, yeah, you know, the, the short end is just kind of uh, wearing many hats is the, the biggest challenge. Yeah. Uh, God's garage. Writes in and says, hello, cohorts, and welcome, Janet. We're all excited to have you, I'm sure. I heard we were talking indie games, and a big conversation point right now is PlayStation's Play at Home initiative releasing eight indie games, some normal and some VR for free, including titles like Subnautica, Abzu, Thumper. However, I've heard some complaints that PlayStation isn't doing enough for their fan base when compared to Microsoft with their games with gold acquisition, or games with gold stuff, and everything they've been putting out on Game Pass after the Bethesda acquisition. There it is. My question to you, are people justified in being mad at PlayStation for giving away indies instead of AAA titles? Or are these complaints just those of whiny baby gamers who need to play more games outside of the normal <laughs> sphere? 
Ah, uh, the old whiny baby gamers. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was going to, I'm glad that they pointed out the play at home thing because that, in in terms of generosity, that is probably the most generous thing because it's not tied to PlayStation Plus. Yeah. You know, like those games are never going to go away like Game Pass. You're not actually playing for them. They're just giving you free access to those games forever. And they do, they did have Ratchet and Clank, I think, yep. on there. And Horizon Zero Dawn's coming said, soon, yeah. Yep, Horizon's coming. So I, I think... I, I think it's 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 less that, you know, like Sony is not being as generous or giving away as much stuff as I think I think there's a desire for Sony to kind of follow in Microsoft's blueprint, like their their new kind of uh, business blueprint of of what they're doing with Game Pass, because yeah. it's it's really not generosity on Microsoft's part as much as it is. Hey, buy into this monthly subscription that you'll pay for the rest of your life in order to play all the games that we're putting on there. And I, I, I can, I can understand that desire. I don't, I don't, I'm not on board with saying, "Hey, Sony, you should be giving us more free stuff. You're not as generous." But I, I would totally buy into a PlayStation if PlayStation Now was structured the same as Game Pass was, and if they were as proactive about getting other games on there. I would totally be down for that. Yeah. Chris Logan writes in, says, hey, Janet, question for you. And this is a very specific question. We apologize in advance for this question. Um, Chris Logan wants to know, what is definitively the greatest work of art of oh, all time? Yeah. Oh, God, I was trying to think of this. I even mm-hmm. like said, like, oh, I like this question, but then I never actually thought of the answer. <laughs> it's nearly so- impossible. I, yeah, I mean, I don't even know why I'm trying to be honest, but yet here I am. It's never stopped me before. Uh-huh. Um, at first I was thinking games, but then I just feel like the greatest artwork probably isn't games. I, I think games has so many, because it has user input, it just becomes so varied that I don't know that that could be the greatest arc of all time. Then I try to think film. I don't think I know film enough for that. <laughs> okay. Art, same deal. Um, so yeah, I don't really have a great answer to this, but um, there is a painting I really like. It's oh. definitely not the best in the world but um you need to see, double down you need to be her, confident janet that it is the greatest yes. work of art of all time um one of i think my favorite painting ever is a woman at her towel at apologies for the pronunciation if i mispronounced it uh it is an impressionist piece it's by birth Marisol. uh it's hanging in the arts of chicago and it's this picture it's like extremely beautiful looking of this woman like at her towel at, which is kind of like a vanity it's like where you would get ready like way back in the day um and her like back is toward the viewer and like I just think not only is it a gorgeous painting, but it really uh, captures that moment in time where women sort of had a, a small set of spaces that were their own and the idea of like privacy versus like not was like a big conversation piece. Um, I just think there's a lot to dig into in that painting. So I'm going to go with that. There it as is. the greatest piece of art of all time. Lock it in. Uh, Victor Fam writes in and asks, uh, do you ever feel like you need to qualify things you say as your opinions or add things like IMO to your sentences? <laughs> Do you do it preemptively when you're about to deliver a spicy hot take? I don't know. I mean, sometimes it's different I, now. I, I, I feel like as a writer, that had that was a habit that had to be beaten out of me because it's like when you're writing a review, it's implied. Like you don't have to say right. like, "Well, I think the, this thing in this game it, it doesn't work well." And like every any time I like just like wrote that kind of absentmindedly it would just be like yeah no duh like <laughs> like the i think or in my opinion stuff is irrelevant you right. don't need to qualify it and i think that has slowly bled into like yeah because i think everyone kind of wants to view as like try like opinions is like trying to get at like an absolute truth like we were talking about last week is like well i think this is the best thing but it's like anytime like it, it is coming from a, a like a, some a human being it is kind of implied that that is that person's opinion. Right. Right. And I know that we always talk about like, well, what's the best versus favorite, but I think that it, it is all in to some degree favorite. Right. So it, it was a thing that I think I used to do um, as part of like a larger thing where I think my biggest weakness as a writer is I tend to like hem and haw about like, well, like I could see why someone would like this, but, but that's I think not really like, too helpful. Yeah, I had to develop the discipline to say like, no, I am confident in my assertion as like, if I'm going to do this for a job, I have to like, assert that this is you know what i think and like that that has some weight behind it do you think that fans of the genre cliche 
does that come from that hemming and hawing of like that's just for a reviewer if they aren't really into it they get to say fans of the genre might find something to like in this dynasty warriors yeah eight. i also wonder if that's like from when maybe the pool of both writers and games is a little smaller and people would kind of acknowledge like well i'm reviewing this particular type of game and i'm not like the biggest fan of it yeah and so they use that it's like i guess if you like these types of games this is one of those but like you know as someone who isn't super versed in the genre like i don't have like a, a reason to tell you like whether or not you know gran turismo three you know super edition if that's worth another round like if that's worth another buy over gran turismo three right right that's funny because i think it should be the opposite and that's how i try to i also hate fans of the genre but i still use it sometimes (laughs) because sometimes (laughs) it's the only way to really talk about it Uh um but for me when i say fans of the genre i only say that if i know that genre really well and i am i am the expert fan of the genre because like there are games where um you know I, i recently reviewed uh, a game called I think what comes next um it's like a narrative game about like death and stuff and uh it definitely was on the weaker end but I do think if you are a fan of that genre you'll find an appreciation because I, I did I thought the writing was really strong but like the gameplay was kind of weak etc etc a bunch of qualifiers but yes I couldn't recommend it the way I can recommend a game like what remains of you the finch where I'm like if you are willing to play a video game make this be the one you play. I think that's one of the greatest games of all time. Uh, and it's not terribly difficult to play either. Um, so that's when I use it. And for the, in my opinion, uh, I do try to steer away from that. Everything's an opinion. I really wish that the general discourse of humanity acknowledged that more and was more comfortable with it. Right. Um, I've had plenty of the hostile interactions with people where, you know, they, they people can get upset when you don't like the thing that they like, or if you like the thing they hate, but I don't, I'm like, I don't see why, because, like, uh, you didn't, unless you made it, like, and even that, I mean, you can argue that maybe you shouldn't get upset either, but I'm like, look, man, I'm not making any money off you buying The Last of Us 2. I'm going to tell you that I like it, and if you disagree, I don't, I don't particularly care. Uh, watch my video. Like, you know, it's kind of, right. it kind of is what it is, but a lot of people do attach, have weird hangups on fandom, as if, like, getting more people to like or dislike something is part of winning or losing a, a battle. Um, I tend to use, in my opinion, if I feel maybe a little bit less uh expert in things so like i really love bravely default 2 it is currently my game of the year but that is a very in my opinion game for me because i don't play jrpgs i actually actively kind of dislike a lot of them and i love that game but i acknowledge that a lot of things i love about it have existed for like a lot of games it's like oh yeah like most jrpgs do that i'm like okay that's cool and i get that and i acknowledge that but for me like i really love this game for x y and z reason and yeah i'm not the best person to talk about bravely default 2 and if i wrote for an outlet i would never review bravely default 2 because i don't have expertise but if i'm making like a podcast or just reviewing it on my own and, and couching it in where I'm coming in as an expert or lack of expert then i'm just going to go and, and kind of put it out there so yeah. that's usually when i lean on uh, mm-hmm. imo yeah uh let's see oh hunter s sax writes in with a very specific question saying yay we have a janet and he says okay all right janet this is a very specific obscure question that only you can answer you're the only person on planet earth during kind of funny's in review of justice league you randomly showed up you randomly showed up for like a second do you just have access to their Discord channel? Did you hack them? <laughs> Does the whole industry secretly share a Discord channel? It's one of the most random cameos I've ever seen. Um, first of all, thank you for watching my appearance in uh, that video. Um, but yeah, that is a question. Jeez, I did not expect that. that this was not in the Slack message. I know, that I this no morning. heads up on this but, one. But um, so <laughs> I appeared on a kind of funny for a FIFA game that day. And because I've appeared... Previously, for like Games Daily, uh, I got invited into a server they use for content specifically. So it's got very minimal channels, like Live 1, Live 2, kind of like little rooms. Um, and so I was there for FIFA. And I remember like blessing Eddie O.A. Jr. being like, make sure you don't go into this other one because that's Games <laughs> Daily. Don't crash Games Daily. I'm like, I got you. I got you. I'm in the waiting room. I'm like, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to mess this up. Uh-huh. Like I was getting into the headspace. And then I was told, OK, go to Live 2. But when I heard Live 2, I heard Live, comma, T-O-O like live also so i just went to the first thing that said live which was not live two it was live one and i was like there for like a good 30 seconds uh and then it takes a while to like click in your camera and stuff on discord and stuff so i like didn't hear people talking but i didn't know what was going on and then you know greg's like get get out of here what are you doing here and then i was like (laughs) then i just said hi because i didn't know I, I, if I if I was in a better state of mind, I might have said, my bad or sorry, but instead I just said, hi. And then I processed, oh, you're not supposed to be in here. And then I just left. And then when I got to where I needed to be, 
I was like, should I tell everyone that I like mess that up? And I'm like, I'm just not going to say anything. <laughs> I'm just not going to say anything. I'm like, it is what it is. Um, Were there comments? Like, know, maybe, what was that? Or was everybody too um, focused on Batman's cape is weird? I didn't read the comments on it, okay. but I did post it on, on TikTok a clip out because it was funny. Like I watched it myself later, <laughs> okay, which good. was painful to watch, but it was worth it for the content. Um, uh-huh, and uh-huh. a lot of people, uh, you know, once I had shared on Twitter, too, because I thought it was funny. And uh, people were like, I'm going to watch this specifically for this. Or a lot of people in my uh, Discord, you know, I have a lot of people that are from the kind of funny community and, and people from the existing Min Max community as well. Yeah. Like there's a lot of crossover in, in that fandom. And people were like, hey, why weren't you like here and stuff like that? So then I, you know, a few of my uh, community members were like, now I'm definitely going to go watch it just to see (laughs) you appear by accident. So uh, that's what happened. I I do like the idea that we all have one giant server, though, Mm -hmm. for that over the reality. It'd be a lot more fun that way. Yeah. (laughs) Thank (laughs) you for the behind the scenes look. (laughs) Colin Birch writes in and says, hey, everybody, uh, real quick. Please have a regularly occurring show with Jeff Quark and Joe Juba, not necessarily together or with a set schedule. And I absolutely acknowledge I have no idea if you even get along or ever did. Just bum thinking I won't hear them anymore on podcasts. Um, okay, this takes some setting up. Uh, Joe Juba, um, this is his last week at Game Informer after 17 years there. Just a, an amazing run. So send a congratulations his way on a, on a great journey. Um but the weird thing is Jeff Cork, Jeff Cork does have a show at Mid Max called Better Quest. There's a new episode coming up on Friday where we set personal goals every single month along with the community. So there's your Jeff Cork show. Check out the episode on Friday. But uh, in terms of having a Jeff Cork and Joe Juba show, <laughs> who knows if we keep growing, but no plans right now. But obviously uh, they're welcome to do whatever. We do get along, I believe. Except for Jeff and with Joe. It's always been weird. Uh, you cut out there, no but I, it was vile. I said that's not true. <laughs> okay, what's your favorite memory of working with Joe Juba? Uh, I I love Joe. I actually I sent him we we sent some messages after he announced that, and he's he's one of the guys that I miss seeing every day. So you two seem. I, I don't know. I don't know about favorite memory with him. Okay. They were all good. All oh, the Joe. Wow, memes. everyone is top yeah. notch. Taylor Owens writes in and says, Hey everyone, and welcome Janet. It's time to play everyone's favorite game. Will it ever come out? These are all officially announced games that have not been officially canceled yet. Question is, will they ever come out? Elder Ring will never come out. He doesn't even game list over. Elder Ring on this as an option, Mistake you idiot. number one. Are, are we allowed <laughs> to win this? Because we don't know for, like, is this just going to be a really long, like, it goes years on from forever. Now, yeah. Like, okay, finally, all of these games have either been canceled or released. Here is the final result for this game. It'll, yeah, it, we'll have a follow-up at some point, Cyril. Even if it's like okay. when the sun's exploding, we'll come back for a bonus episode. And you can count on that. We'll okay, be back to right. let you know uh, what we think and who won <laughs> we're, this. We're live here post sun explosion. <laughs> the uh, the end of days. <laughs> mm-hmm. Live you know, streaming I, persists. I, I once had servers are really strong. <laughs> I once had a health teacher who gave us a a true or false quiz, and one of the questions on it was, "Everyone will get cancer if they live long enough." And I put true, and a lot of people put true, and she was like, "No, that's false," and because people die of other things, and I was like, "Well, that just means that they didn't live long enough to get it." And she thought about it, and then she gave us all credit for it because she realized it was a <laughs> flawed question, and this is a flawed quiz. Hang those on, are the, those are my highlights in high school. Was like any time yeah. you were like, "No, the question is wrong. I'm right." I like, got you. The, the yes. four times, and I'm life, 14 years that. old, lady. Yeah, man. Yeah, just think I hate about students sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but just think about it like from the teacher's perspective or from the people that write those questions. I don't know where these questions come from, but that's like their worst nightmare, right? Is the idea that, oh my God, As students yeah, I will find- say that the memories students have of their teachers where whether it's like, I got them or an embarrassing, like we, I'm telling you right now, we do not care, nor do we probably remember. It's like, <laughs> yeah. look, man, there's like 120 of y'all and I'm just trying to like get this thing graded. And you're like, why isn't it graded? And I'm like, I don't know. Why am I working on the weekend when it's a Monday through Friday job? Yeah. I got questions too. Yeah, I got questions too. We can, you want to talk about it? Let's talk about it. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I do think it's, it's funny how much students are like very into like the realities of their teachers being human. Um, I think those questions are usually probably put in as a gaff, but then sometimes it backfires and you're like, we've all had those lessons we've taught where it's like, all right, man, 
this was not my best work. Uh, we're going to forget that we even did this. Let's just do something else. Let's just yeah, do something I, else. Yeah, it was it was like you got this weird satisfaction of like, oh, like the the, the like the this power source that has always felt infallible. I finally got to like poke at it, whereas on their side, it's like, I don't get a paid enough to really care. So I right. guess you can have this one. Yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't trying to topple a god or anything i just you wanted did. a point for the that question. was the day you toppled the god <laughs> yeah. uh anyways hey jeff from the question is uh will bayonetta 3 ever come out <laughs> yeah uh yeah does anyone yeah. think okay oh. maybe how about you just say if you don't think these will come out does anybody think that bayonetta 3 will never be released well, it's hard to say never, right? Because it could be released, you know, 30 years from now. But I think, like, <laughs> yeah, well, we're probably never going to see something like StarCraft Ghost. I can't imagine that game ever comes out, right? Like, that game is, right. is, is no chance. Of, but I think Bayonetta 3 will probably come out. I think anything that has a Nintendo backing, I mean, I'm trying to think of a big example of, like... Pikmin. What? Oh, Pikmin. Pikmin. But they never Pikmin announced 4, right? Pikmin 4. It was just like Miyamoto. They said and it was done. That he was like, it's done. It's ready now. But, Any second now. And then it's like, what happened? <laughs> and it's just like. Si but I think there's a difference between yeah. like, you know, Miyamoto in some interviews saying, oh, yeah. Oh, we were, we were done with Pikmin here versus like an official announcement in Nintendo Direct. Right. Like they can't control there is, that but wildcat. Why it's the same, though. That's the thing. This is an emotion conversation. Right. Why it's a vibe. Right. Yeah, yes. that's good. Okay, so Bayonetta 3, it will come out. Uh, what about Michelle Ancel's Wild? The PlayStation, I believe, exclusive. Uh, th there's no way this is coming out. No. No, <laughs> no. Let it go. It was, what, 2014, I think, when they showed it? And yeah, it, there's there's no chance. Uh, Skull and Bones. No. The old no. chestnut. No! No. I say yes. I say yes, but it'll look so different, and they'll probably just call it Black Flag 2 or something at that point. Just, like, completely 180. They, they're going to rebrand That's a question. It. Does it count as coming out if it has a different name? Mm. I think it would, right? I think as long as they acknowledge that, like, yeah. what Skull and Bones now called assassin's creed or something but like yeah but but that that one specifically doesn't count if they decide to scrap what they what that game was going to be and then go back to the format that they already had yeah okay. what, what if it's like the official second dlc for like assassin's creed miami or whatever and it's like the second <laughs> dlc it doesn't count because you can't buy it alone. Stolen bone. It's got to be a purchasable okay. mm -hmm. alone product. God, I can't wait for Assassin's Creed. Or downloadable Miami. alone product. What if they just need the key for it? What if it just released Assassin's Creed Miami and it was just all present day? It was just basically Vice City 2. How great would that be? Um, okay, Babylon's Fall, which is the RPG that Square Enix is publishing that Platinum is developing the review like they had a trailer was like a bunch of dates flying by i think that's happening i don't think that's getting um what is that dragon game that went down and scale flames? bound yeah it's not getting yeah, scale yeah. bounded i Can think we it, turn that into the verb like that game's getting scale that game is scale bound <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's the new game is this game scale bound or not i think that one's fine okay beyond good and evil 2 that's the one I was waiting for. That's never coming out. That's scale bound as hell. There's no way, right? I think it will, but not, I'm gonna say I yes, think, and it's gonna suck. Okay, bold. I think it's a PS6 game. If I'm being honest, I think I think I'm with you. Uh, well, I I think it's gonna be a long time. When Michelle Ancel left Ubisoft, he had some statement about like Beyond Good and Evil Two is coming along great without me. See ya. But like. I just I think it's a tough structure, and especially when Ubisoft is now making their open world Star Wars games, they're still making that open world Avatar game. Like the idea of let's spend bazillions more dollars to try and crack what this living weird game of Beyond Good and Evil Two is. There's just no way. I that think game's that also odd because it has that creator, like anyone can make piece like assets or right. like sound for the game. Yeah. I feel like that's just opening up a lot of like future lawsuits too. I could see it maybe getting. I don't know if that's also. You know, they say like, oh, it's so it's like, isn't this a fun, creative project? But it's like, oh, I don't know. Is this also like unpaid labor? Is it also like you didn't want to pay for someone to, you know, it's, it's, it's got some weird development stuff going on. Mm -hmm. I could almost see it being like the, 
the game that they're working on now is not what gets released. Like, there's another concept like, oh, yeah, we're making an open world game in the future. And at some point, it's like, well, that, that, that'll just be beyond good and evil 2 now. Like, we, we, we we're going to scrap whatever we were working on now. And that's far enough along. It seems successful enough. It'll be wildly different from what we were expecting. But that'll, that'll be the game we release as beyond good and evil 2. Yeah. Uh, Bioshock 4. Yes. I think it's going to take a while, but I mean, they built up that whole yeah. studio cloud chamber. Is that what it's called? Like, I think yeah. they're, I think they're cranking away on something. That seems likely. I don't think 2K is too big on shelving things. Um, Star Citizen. Will it ever officially release? I'm no. going with two years from now. Janet, you're saying nay? Correct. Okay. I think at yeah, some point I, they'll just announce that they, they're done with development and it, and it won't be like, a, oh, we're canceling it. It's just like, yep, we did it. Yeah. Star Citizen is complete. See you later. And then everyone will just be like, where did my $2 million go? It's, it's a Pikmin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, in the sky. It's all in one closet. There's that Star weird... Citizen and Pikmin 4 are scale bound together in a farm up north. Yeah, they're just all on one external hard drive somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's such a weird one because it's like, Remember they announced so many years ago, like, hey, we got that single player campaign for Star Citizen and Mark Hamill's in it and all these things. But like, are those performances now just locked in time? Are we going to have like this posthumous performance from Mark Hamill within Star Citizen? Yeah, they'll be talking about how it's his greatest performance that he ever gave. Right, right. It's a weird one. Uh, Thank you, Taylor. Um, All right. What do y'all think for a question of the week? I mean, I want to see more personal stories. So I'm kind of... uh bias towards the GameStop one. <laughs> Just the GameStop cars? Yeah. I, I'm going to go with GameStop yeah, cars also. Wow. I mean... Because it, I also used to work at GameStop, by the way. Mm, congratulations. How was that experience for you? Um, It was fine. I mean, it's why I have an N, a min, NES Mini and an SNES Mini, so I think that's good enough. Oh. Holiday 2018 or 19 or something. Oh, it wasn't that was even that long, long ago. ago. Yeah, that's like amazing. 2017, maybe? I don't know. Well, that's weird what post college time. Yeah, that's what Phil's going for. I think is just an homage to your era at GameStop. You're a little bit like a a cool fancy black car on the highway cruising with your minis. So there Are we you go. Anti lag though. What's that? Are you anti lag? Who isn't? Not enough to do anything about it, but... All right, there we go. Congratulations, Phil DeGrave. Question of the week winner. You are going to get that vinyl soundtrack for Untitled Goose Game. Congratulations. Uh, Now it's time for something we call Get a Load of This. Okay, Janet. You don't have to go first, but just get ready to share something that's going to blow our minds. Oh, well, I am ready. (laughs) No, just sit back. Look, Jeffem will show you how it's done. All right, Jeffem. Uh, get a load of this. This is a YouTube video from a channel called Number File, which if you haven't seen any Number File videos, that can just be your get a load of this. It's P-H-I-L-E, and it's all kind of math and geometry videos that, that like really dive into obscure things, but they make it super interesting to learn to the point where I wish I had known about this stuff when I was taking actual math classes. But this one's called base 12 and it's about a numbering like kind of a theoretical numbering system that would be based all around numbers going up to 12 instead of up to 10 okay the way that we count now and they kind of go into our system is base 10 because we have 10 fingers and that's kind of how we started counting and we kind of got locked into that right but all of you know we have the entire system of weights and measures that you know like we consider the u.s to be screwed up because we're all based on a base 12 system with like 12 inches in a foot and stuff like that and the french were the ones that kind of i I didn't realize that that was the original counting system and the french kind of threw that off and got all of europe onto a base 10 system with kilometers and things like that but they but they go into the question of like what would a base 12 system look like and it's it's really mind blowing in in terms of like how how counting would be completely different. And they said that the the main it would actually be really good for everyday life because when you go to the grocery store and you're buying stuff, base twelve is divisible by so many other numbers. And so if if you need like a quarter of something, it would just be three as opposed to two and a half. And they they kind of run through all of these different things. 
and talk about it. And apparently they said there are some there are some cultures in the world that do count by base 12 because they they brought up like, well, it would be harder for kids to learn math because they they have 10 fingers. Yeah. So you'd be asking them to count 12. And they said the way those cultures do it is they look at these fingers and you have three segments on each finger oh. and, and they add up to 12 and they, and apparently that is a counting system that people use. And it's, but the, the system kind of, the video goes through the entire history of base 10 versus base 12. That's so it's, nerdy. It's a really fascinating thing. Yeah, that's perfect. Uh, there's links in the description below. Surreal. Yeah. Uh, I've had, Okay, I need a little bit of context in that I've been thinking about a tweet for a long time. But it's so just to start, there last Friday, Kotaku posted a story with the headline Twitch stop sign stream temporarily stops after address leaks. Neighbors receive pizzas. Uh, so, there, <laughs> just to give you an impression of what's going on, there is a, a, there, well, I think there used to be a channel called Stop Sign Cam, which is literally just. Uh, a stream of a stop sign that people just did not obey. <laughs> okay. Uh, and so at some point, you know, like the story was that like one of the addresses went live, so people knew where that stop sign was located, so they had to stop it. But they, I, I guess, since decided that um, they're going to try to find another stop sign. I, I, the, the quote in the Kotaku source is, we plan to go on the road to the worst stop sign in the area and commence the stream. We shall see how it goes. Uh, so there's a stream that you could have watched uh, that was just literally people disobeying a stop sign. And the tweet that I've been thinking about is uh, from Lonnie at Very Friendly on Twitter, who I believe works at GameSpot at the moment. And they posted a tweet that said, watching a Twitch stream of a stop sign. And the photos had like a user that typed in the chat and it was one of those highlighted messages. So yeah, I think they paid for it. They just said, bro, people need to stop. <laughs> and I have been, that that has become an intrusive thought for me of just like anytime like sometime it'll just randomly like bro people need to stop <laughs> uh, to get out so there. if you want to dig into that or I think at some point find a stream that is just like people disobeying a stop sign yeah uh, that's a fun thing to think about that sounds perfect okay Janet it's time for you to get a load of this now here's Here's the catch. You can't be like Surreal, who's kind of like the bad boy of the podcast. You need to tell people, get a load of this before you dive That's into true. your fact, or else it doesn't matter. Do yeah. okay, get a load of this. <gasps> yeah. Also, those were really like hard to follow up. Also, I know about the stop sign thing. I saw it on TikTok, and people would go and like you know, dance in front of the sign once they figured <laughs> out where it was. So it did there was a gap between people finding out where the sign was and it getting like taken down, um, where people <laughs> would just like go there and goof off and like wave to the the crowd twitch is weird um okay get a load of this the four this is like such a okay i'm just gonna go for it Do the it. formula one season just started if you're into like you know hardcore racing and if you're not into that uh you can get into it because the drive to survive uh documentary or series or whatever just came out on netflix and the only reason i know this because my brother is really into formula one uh and got into that really recently and he even got like we give him the wheel for christmas like he's diving all the Ooh, way in so it. if you're looking for like a little like mental sporty wormhole to go down i suggest that being one of them and then kind of like to the side of that i don't know if this is like leading into stuff that we might talk about next week but cnn did a story about mario dying as if it wasn't just a meme so wait that's really been the highlight of my day yes like they, they thought it was like nintendo canon they okay so the article is and i kind of feel bad i kind of feel bad for the writer like just you know writer to writer it's like damn this is a rough gay girl um Super Mario Bros. fans are panicking over rumors that Mario is going to die. And the, <laughs> the article goes on to say, like, oh, like, you know, like these room, you know, the Internet has this rumor that Mario is going to die. And like, here's how, oh, like, no. the rumor got fueled via Nintendo's business practices. And they, like, reached out to Nintendo. Oh, asking if Mario no. will die. <laughs> We are pulling copies for, you know, we are no longer distributing. You know, they gave like a P very PR answer. Right. Um, and then they even mentioned like, oh, it's worth noting that like this is the day before April Fool's. So maybe this is all just like a gaffe. But like, oh, no, man, <laughs> that's really rough. Like, I don't even like what do you do on that? Like, no. how do you come? Like, I don't I don't know. But like uh, in a uh, Mike from uh, GameSpeed had tweeted out CNN asked Nintendo is Mario really dying? And man, that just makes me feel good. And like, same, <laughs> same. It's just so. You know, I, I try not to dunk too much on like, you know, mainstream media covering game stuff. I guess like a, it's it's a challenging thing when you're an outside perspective. But oh, like, yeah, 
Man, that's really rough. That is a tough spot to be in because it's like all the pieces are there. I understand why you'd write that story and just not quite yeah. have the idea that it's all a stupid joke. Yeah, I, I, I do also feel for the PR people who have to like pretend that it's it's not like a illegitimate question where their you know their instinct is to reply. Mario's not real dumb. And they, but instead, they have to write like a whole statement of like, oh, you know, we're this is part of a promotion, but Mario is still very near and dear to our hearts. <laughs> near to our hearts. I think it's the best way to put it. Um, hey, get a load of this. Uh, I'm a big fan of the podcast Play, Watch, Listen, which Lana Pierce hosts. Um, and last week, they had this moment that blew my mind. Uh, Mike Bithell's on it. Speaking of Thomas was alone. Um, and he brought up apparently this fact that pyramids existed on earth the same time as mammoths and i said that can't be right the egyptian pyramids no way turns out yes uh business insider has an article here about the fact that there were mammoths that were surviving on islands in between alaska and russia like four thousand years ago so there were technically mammoths alive on planet earth while the or after the pyramids had been built just for a fun That's Earth timeline. Them. I didn't want to say it, but it seems I'm to be not, leaning in that direction. Uh, Jeff, did you pull one from the community, from the Discord? Yeah, get a load of this. It was originally the stop sign uh, story. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've been blown up about that. Uh, so instead, we will substitute one from Roris. Uh, this is a tweet from someone named Radicube. And it says, this just in, Bowser's baton dance sings perfectly with Britney Spears' Toxic. Mm -hmm. Notice this like five years ago, but only just remembered last night during an all nighter. So I'm sharing this to make sure none of us ever has to forget again. And he's got the video with it synced perfectly to Ooh, Toxic. That's beautiful. And Bowser's got some moves. Mm -hmm. The link is below for all you weirdos out there. Um, hey, Janet, thanks for joining us on your first official podcast. The other ones were a, yeah. a mere prelude. Thanks for the warm welcomes from like all y'all and the community. It kind of felt like it was my birthday, which was nice. I was like, oh, okay, like hello, like it, it was a, uh, it was nice. I appreciated it. Yeah. Um, is there anything you want to do at Minmax? This we should have talked about this offline. Is there anything that you're like dying, like oh, I can't wait to, I don't know, steer things in this direction or to you know, new show plus options? Is there anything you're especially excited to tackle? Ooh, uh, I wouldn't say super especially, but I will say that uh, I love indie games, so I'm looking forward to trying to dig in and find, like, I would love to be able to highlight the games that maybe no one else is talking about, which is mm. hard when people are always making content, but um, that's something I really would like to do. And then also, um, I think given our earlier conversation, we should do a, a new game plus of browsing the eShop. Oh, and just, show. you know, Honestly, just we, vibes, see what games you can get. We had that as an option called eShopping Spree. And it lost yes. one week, but it was the, actually the origin for that entire show. And so at some point, we'll, we'll put it back and let Patreon supporters vote on whether or not we do it. I, I'm totally We could also you. do like an alternative version that wouldn't involve just streaming like the eShop account would be like a challenge where we have like $10 or something right. and it has to be like the, who has the best game or something like that. Like, it is fun. Some, something like that could be cool. All right. That sounds great. Uh, thanks to everybody who has watched this or listened to this or supports us over on Patreon. Just a heads up that uh, we have the big call-in episode of MinMax Council that is live in the Patreon exclusive podcast feed, which you can access to if you support us over there on Patreon. Um, and we had Crossfade's co-hosts, uh, Jason Daphnis and Matt Helgeson on, and we took a bunch of calls from the community, played music trivia. It was a really fun time. So if you're looking for a long form, loose but fun uh, podcast. You can check out Minmax Council every single week and the big call-in episode with Matt Helgeson was especially fun. Also, the last episode of Crossfader Music Podcast was uh, a very good one. We had Austin Winery on, who's the composer, oh, also on uh, Playwatch List. Listen, weirdly enough, um, but composer of, you know, Journey, Assassin's Creed Syndicate, uh, The Pathless, which we also talked about on this episode of the podcast. So it's Austin Winery talking about how influential, quietly, Cat Stevens has been on his entire career. So if you're the type of nerd that loves Austin Winery and Cat Stevens, Crossfade is a podcast for you. So thanks to everybody who subscribes to Crossfade. Um, also, in the Discord, I want to let everybody know what you get access to if you support us at any tier on Patreon. Um, the community is doing their own community game clubs, and they're going through Metroidvanias throughout the entire year, and they just started Iconoclast. So they want everybody to know that you can jump in there and play along with the community if you want to play a ton of great Metroidvanias this year. 
And thank you so much to the following supporters at the $50 tier. Uh, we're talking Will Cornelius, another Eden on Steam. I am 8-Bit, Mercurica Torreno, Moonface Nick, Zachary Pliggy, Beaten Down Brian, Rated G for Gamers, Mark Seliga, Andrew Yukowitz, Jawar, hello, Brian with a Y, PrettyGoodPrinting.com, Andrew Valla, Ludwig Roque, Super Serious Sam, Yaro, Spiral in Your Eyes, Richard Smuts, Clint Farley, Clayton Myers, Prethim Yar Legata, Spider Dan, Starkiller, Steve Bamda, Jesse Vitelli, Slick Nick, Alex Payne. Thank you so much, everybody. Janet, thank you for being here. And be good, have fun, let's go!